in St. Patrick's and the Tidal Wave, guys. This is wonderful. I have a little slide for those who don't know much about the North Institute. I won't spend too much time on it. You will get copies of all of the, the slides, but the slides will mean a lot unless you've actually been at the session. So I hope you share your information back and forth. Uh, but just to start off the morning today, it is Saturday. I thought I'd do something a bit fun. Normally on a Saturday, I go to my orchestra. Um, so who remembers what instrument I play? Anybody? French horn. French horn, yes. So I would normally be at my orchestra. I'm not there today, obviously. But what I wanted to do is share a bit of my music with you. And it's music that, uh, I don't play very well on it, but that's okay. But it was commissioned in support of seafarers. When I was, uh, yeah, and you hope that you clap at the end, too. <laughs> you won't be going, oh no, that was horrible. When I was president of the Nautical Institute, and yes, I was the first female president of the Nautical Institute, I keep slipping that in because it was really cool. When I was president, I had at the end, there was a big event, the only event I attended in person as president, because I was president throughout all of COVID. And that's how I got to know the, the wonderful Captain Levy. Uh, we spend every Saturday night together. That sounds really bad, doesn't it? But for about two months, every Saturday night, there was an event that was run by the Nautical Institute right from here. I'm happy to be in the living room, actually. That was set, celebrating those who were going the extra mile during COVID to support seafarers. So when I finished my term of president, I said, what can I do that would have a lasting impact that can support and can show my support to feed seafarers. And I wanted to marry it with my love of music. So I commissioned a friend of mine to write a piece of music. It's called The Triumphant Sea Shanty. And he wrote it for my wind ensemble, which is called The Blue Ray Winds. And he rehearsed in my living room. We tried to go to our recording studio. The recording studio didn't work, so the recording we ended up with was on phones. Um, but it's pretty good. It's not, not the best. But it is done with a lot of heart, a lot of love for seafarers. For those who just came in, we have, uh, if you're, we want to make up maritime management, management can go on this table right here, I think. So we need to mix it up. So I'm going to play the Triumphant Sea Shanty. Uh, and I'm going to leave it right to the very end because there's a few thoughts on there. During my time of president as well, I started something called Maritime Matters. Uh, a short video series where I interview people from around the world about why maritime, why seafarers, why shipping matters. And I put this out under my Maritime Matters banner. I'm, it was called Maritime Matters, the, the Maritime Professional during COVID-19. I'm going to continue it. I've sort of had a hiatus, but I'm going to continue it. And I'm Maritime Professionals in Challenging Times. Because COVID might sort of be over, we're not sure if things are happening, but we're still having challenges. And seafarers, no shipping, no shopping. No seafarers, no shipping, no shopping. So we need to have the seafarers, and we need to have maritime professionals to ship afloat and ashore working together. So bear with me, and I hope Sarah's gonna work. Okay, that's my, my wind ensemble. We actually got dressed up for it. We put little paper pirate hats on and everything. We had a great, we had a really fun time. So let me get the music going. Here it is. And there it is. Make it full screen. Sorry, exit full screen. And bring it over. That's what sound goes. This, this really needs sound, guys. So you're on. You're saying yes, it will work. Thank you. 
that we are much more than just what we are here at school, that we are here in our training as maritime professionals. We are whole people, we're very holistic. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the some of the things what it means to be a maritime professional. Now let's get everything going. For those who are late you can tell them what they missed. This is the final set of sessions that we have for today. There's only two sessions. We will go now until 11 o'clock when we will break for tea. And then we'll come back at 11.15 and we'll go until about 12, 12.10. And then we'll have an open mic session until 12.30. And then I've been told that you'll be all out here by 1 o'clock, which I'm sure you'll be very happy so you can go in and enjoy your Saturdays. So looking for the future, I have talked a bit about the Nautical Institute. It is an incredible organization to be part of. It's global with, with the development of online meetings that means we actually have a lot of access to each other in an international framework. I'm just going to ask if we could mix up, we need a couple of management people on this table here. So uh, two management people, please. I need a couple of management people over there. So I'm not sure where they all are right now. We might have less management than we do maritime, but please make sure you make stuff. We want to make sure that we get all ideas in. So the Nautical Institute is an organization for maritime professionals, which means there for you as maritime professionals. Some more management people. Hello, welcome. Please come. Good. Could we have two on this table up front here, and one over on that table there, please? 
So two up here and one over there for now. Oh, oh we got more coming in as well. Look at that. Okay, session did start at 9.30. It's now 9.45. That's okay. Have a seat there. Thank you. Please, management people, we have some space here. A management person here, one here, and two over there, please. We came in, so one over here, two over there, and one here, please. As a member of the Nautical Institute, you get access to publications, online training, a discount on, on the books that they, they publish, so you've got a lot of opportunity, and the biggest thing that I have for you is it's free for students. Um, and that's brand new. So it's free for students. It's only been free for students for a few months. Um, so please take advantage of the fact that it's free. And it's there. And you're very kind of professionals. I'm not going to go into too much detail doing it. All the brand rules, it makes pretty much sense. I think the people at the back, the issue is the people at the back can't read those very well. There's somebody on a table who's only one person on the table. There's space for you somewhere up here. Or so I'm going to join you. We need, we need groups on the tables. Yep. On the sheet. That's good. Everyone has something to contribute. You will be contributing. Those who are here before will know that you will contribute. And we do have you present the results of your discussions. I'd like to see people speak. Ideally, someone who hasn't before to give them an opportunity to speak to the group. It's a very safe learning environment. We're not judgmental at all. And we're all here to learn for the same purpose. I do say speak in turn. And that means when someone's speaking, you listen. And if you're speaking, you expect them to listen. And it's really just all about respect. And because we get so excited about the work we're doing, and someone's spoken, and they sit down and they go, oh, okay, that went okay, how did it go? They want to talk to each other at the table. Please try and remember to not speak while someone's speaking. If you do, I put my hand up in the air, and that's the universal signal for you to be quiet. Obviously not the person with the microphone, you keep talking. I'm usually doing that to get someone else to talk quiet. I also will put my finger to my lips, and I might look at somebody at the table with someone speaking, and then that would be your cue to go to that person and go, quiet, she's arguing. Just because I want to hear what you have to say, and it can be hard to hear, even with a microphone, when other people are talking. Back to back with this name. Okay, I'm going to go away from the people who've been here before. If you've been here before, you don't answer this one until I come to you. What's active listening? What does it mean to listen actively? Anyone? What does it mean to be active listeners? What does it mean to listen actively? Right? Notes. Okay, good one. What does it mean to listen actively? Notes, yeah, we got notes. What else? How else do you do it? Good body language. Eye contact, being alert, focused, nodding or shaking your head, whatever it means, yes. What else means? What else is active listening? Someone who wasn't here before. What's active listening? Pardon? Being attentive? Yeah. Say out loud. Being attentive in the session. And that means thinking about what's happening. Our minds are going really fast. When you came in the room and you sat down, I'm speaking, and your mind is thinking about, have I tidied up my room? Do you guys have uh, inspections in your rooms on Saturday mornings as cadets? Oh, you're lucky. A Sunday. Yeah. So you might be thinking, oh, is my room a mess? What am I going to have to do? What did I have? What am I going to have for lunch? So your mind is going really fast. But you have to slow them down to listen. That's one way that you can actively listen and really focus. Anyone? You don't think I've got an idea? No? That's one way you can actively listen that you can know for sure that you understand what I've said. How can you know for sure that you understand what I've said? Asking questions and getting feedback. Yeah. So ask questions. Good interactions. And when you're on the table, I want you to actually actively listen to each other. It's so easy sometimes to listen to think about what we someone's going to say. 
someone starts a sentence and they say, for breakfast I had, and you're going to say, oh, I know, she had a dosha. No, maybe I'm going to say, for breakfast I had fruit salad and yogurt. If you don't listen to everything, you don't know what the answer is. Sometimes someone will start a sentence and you'll try and finish it. Please don't do that. That's not active listening. Active listening is really focusing on what someone's saying. And we're going to do it because communication is critical. Every incident we thought there is that I've ever read has communication as an element. If we can't communicate, then we cannot move forward. Active listening is key. Focus, respect time. That means come back on time when I go for break, please. I'll respect your time as well. Mobile's on silent. Uh, prices go up today. I think it's going to be 500 rupees submission to see pairs if I hear it go. We've got a couple of people. I had one person the day before yesterday, one person yesterday. I think it was a teacher, actually. Was it you? <laughs> What's that? It was the IT department. Okay, yeah, yeah. You guys care too. I know they're using their phones to play the music. But I do want you on your phone for internet research. And you will need your phone for activities. So have it handy, just have it on mute. And if you have any questions, I have what's called in my mind even an anchorage area. If you have any questions that don't fit at the time of the presentation, write them down, save them, or come back to them in the open mic. Okay, what we're going to do. Short session, really, it's only half a day. We're going to look to the future. As per the schedule, I'm going to focus a bit on knowledge and training and STCW. So apologies to those who might be in management and think this doesn't apply to them. It does, because training curriculums are pretty much the same the world over. So STCW, I, I will use that as an example, but the way training curriculums are developed are pretty much the same everywhere. I'm going to talk a little bit about upgrading in the future. And I had a slide from a friend of mine. He was on he was on the video there. He was a young fella. His name is Yuren, he's from Malaysia, and he ran a workshop with young people. He's on the Younger Members Council of the NI, which is also something you can go to. You can apply to join the Younger Members Council of the NI. And they're doing some really exciting work. But this one, the outcomes, I'm going to help them up from this session. And it's really about what the younger teachers are looking for in the future for their role. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. And then, after break, we move into autonomous systems. So something completely different. Why not? Mass. And then we'll have the open mic. So, change is happening all around us. I make a good use of this photo. I got caught in traffic yesterday. I was late to class. It's really bad when the teacher's late to class. I, I apologize again. I'm sorry. I really did not want that to happen. But I made good use of my time. You've probably seen this poster around town, haven't you? It seems to be everywhere. Change is happening everywhere in all industries. And a lot of the things that we've been speaking about over the week and talk to your colleagues who've been at those workshops include blockchain, data science, cloud computing, big data analytics, artificial intelligence. Um, and we didn't get into the more nitty gritty of the whole stack Python and, and JSON. But those are the things that are happening all around us. Maritime is no different. So it's not just you who are facing this concept of an uncertain future in a digital environment. Pretty well everyone, because we're all doing it, even me. I want to set the scene with a short little video. Now let me pull it up. And this one doesn't have sound. Let me just get my video up. There we go. Put the video off of LinkedIn by a friend of mine called Ricky Rouse. This is a new style of ship. This is a ship with a, a rigid sail in a stowed position. So he's showing what it's like to be piloting this vessel. And this keeps replaying. So he was piloting this vessel out of Newcastle Port about five days ago, I think. It just came in. And and you can see, it's kind of hard to see, but it gives a good visual of the misery player. Where we 
that's the sale. That's, I'm sorry, that's the sale there. So it's in the stowed position. It almost gives them like a little leading line, doesn't it? It's kind of cool. What's that? It's, it's kind of uh, eight yes, of helicopter. Yes, so that the pilots off of Newcastle often uh, are boarding by helicopter. So that's a helicopter. But what is interesting is sail assisted. So that's the ridge of sail. I'll go back to the photograph in a minute. But it's the sort of thing that that those in the industry right now are dealing with with no training. I mean, you don't get training on how to pilot a vessel that's got a sail on it. Uh, you're just expected to do it. They did do some simulation before it came in, but it's the first one of its kind. There are vessels that are coming out with new types of fuels that will handle differently with different types of propulsion systems. Now, there's not going to be a training system on a training course on every single system of propulsion, or a training course on every single style of, of new fuel. There will be training, I think, on the risks associated with fuels. So we're still working on all of that. But it's interesting because he just goes ahead and does it. And we've got another image from him a bit later on about something that he's been working on. So I'm just going to minimize that. Let's go back to here. So you can see the sail out now. So when he piloted, this sail was in a stowed position. But that sail, so it's a sail-assisted vessel. Kind of cool. So to set the scene, everything is changing. But actually, it's not that different from the, everything else in the world. Let me get my mouse back here again. There we go. And then to set the scene, and people are just arriving, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get you guys thinking about what's happening. We're going to talk about learning the knowledge. So the pilot didn't actually learn about how to pilot a vessel that's powered by sail, or sail hybrid sail and, and engine. He just had to do it. So we had to have some sort of knowledge. What's the difference between learning and knowledge? I want you and your table groups to talk about what is learning, what is knowledge, and I want somebody at the end to present the results of your discussion. Now, I usually say you can go on the internet. I'd like you first just to talk about it. Don't immediately Google it. Don't Google this. Think about the concept, what is learning? What does it mean to learn something? And what is knowledge? What's the difference between them? Or is that? It's up to you. I'm going to give you five minutes for your discussion. We'll check in after five minutes.
Take my tea away. We have about one minute left in our discussion, so start wrapping it up and choose who's going to be presenting for your table. And knowledge. What is a good person? What is learning? What's knowledge? How are they different? I'm going to go with a volunteer. Who wants to go first? Um, okay, we're going to bring you first. Just a second. Uh, point to one. First of all, uh, learning. Learning is something which uh, uh, we get uh, the process of acquiring. Like, uh, 
as you, know, you are explaining about the marine sector. So we are uh, from five days, we are getting it. It's a kind of learning. We are learning it. But uh, when we, uh, some of our friends will go on a ship, they implement that learning on the ships uh, to get a better region. So they will inherit, gain the experience. So the learning with experience is considered as a knowledge. It's really lovely and very succinct. Learning plus knowledge. Learning plus experience equals knowledge. This goes first and then you're next. Good morning, guys. Uh, so, according to me, uh, learning is the process of observing and, uh, and applying the observational information in solving tasks both complex and and this can be done on a daily basis. We learn everything from our surroundings. And when this knowledge is been tested on multiple occasions and actively used, it is known as observation. So, learning plus experience, again, as mentioned, is knowledge. And regarding the concepts, so we have learning and experience, and the concept of experiential learning. So, you're applying that knowledge as well. Uh, yes, you were next. Learning is the process of obtaining the knowledge, and knowledge is something that can be defined. Uh, you acquire over a period of time with proper due diligence and understanding over a particular concept. Knowledge is the product of learning process also. That's an excellent, excellent review. Thinking about learning and knowledge. Well done. Now, what else do we have? Who else wants to go? Who's next? Okay. According to me, learning is a process of acquiring new understanding from some sort of source that may be a teacher, a book, parents, or from surrounding. But knowledge is something which we learn after learning, then we can interact, analyze, and understand things clearly. Excellent. Thank you very much. So learning, uh, through learning we update and through knowledge we upgrade. Uh, basically learning does not mean that you can solve a problem. You just understand the information but through experience we upgrade ourselves and we are willing or, uh, as possible to solve a problem that comes forward. Then learning requires a medium, a teacher, a book or something. The knowledge is experience. We up to That's all. Updating versus upgrading. I love that. That's right in line with the whole thing that Captain Ganon has uh, been talking about. I think uh, knowledge from the world itself, if I split that word, knowledge is to know. So it's something that we did not know, to know that is knowledge. And learning is a process to know that. So knowledge is to know and learning is a process. Okay, got some bit of here. I really need that Fitbit. I wish I got a Fitbit. We get lots of good stuff. Good morning. Learning is simply the acquisition of knowledge through study, experience, or bit thought, or it is transfer form of data. That knowledge is the result of outcome of the learning that is taught data. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes. This is great. You know, lose weight. Good morning, everyone. So we are being, uh, hearing this about learning and knowledge since we have started our schooling. So I would like to take it in a simpler form. So in this five day workshop, what are new things we have? The things which we listen not earlier and which we know that can be given us knowledge. Once I take this knowledge, post it with myself, discuss it with my friends, and have some reflection on what I learned in this five 
finally it happens and when they when they implement it to myself and others that becomes zero so there is a process that is not yet That's really, and I love the thought there as well. So we've almost turned it a little bit on the head that the knowledge that you're gaining here then becomes learning and moves into this concept of lifelong learning because we never, we never stop learning. Anyone else? Yes. So learning is also got that link to the experience that you have. So we've had that a few times. Knowledge, knowledge is something you can share as well. There's a really interesting approach to training that you can take where if you actually have to teach someone something, you actually have to know it that much better. You have to learn it that much better to teach someone because you have to really understand it. Okay, who's next? Anyone left? Who wants to go? This is a volunteer one. Maybe one will have to go. Okay. Uh, learning is about learning. 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 Learning is about do something that wasn't planned, so I'm just going to go with it off script because there's some really great ideas coming out. I want to introduce you to the consciousness levels. Have you heard of these levels of consciousness yet? I'm not going to get into philosophical discussion that we've had before. I'm going to talk a little bit about four levels of conscious incompetence. So just bear with me, I have to open up a new slide because this was not planned. It seems to fit. There we go. Give me a new slide, and I'm going to do it this way, heading only. There we go. Okay. Um, so I can't be talking and typing at the same time because this is the problem again. Um, I'll put the microphone. I hope it works. Otherwise, I'll just pick it up every now and then. Unless someone's going to be kind enough to bring me over the mic stand, that would be great. Thank you. It should be set right because I used it last night. Okay. Yeah, just there. Put this in. Let them stay. Good. I think that's, I think it's good. Can you hear me? Okay. A little bit lower. I can look this way. So I'm going to do an activity here, and it's called. Uh, yeah, that'll be. I think. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. No. Yes. Hands up. Active listening. I don't see any hands up at the very back. Can you hear me? Okay. Good. So levels of confidence, and I'm going to. This is a, a really interesting concept about knowledge and learning and competence, and it's it goes throughout all aspects. Now, let me just pick in, and I'm going to insert. Here, I'll insert a, uh, just a text box, okay. So at the very beginning, you have this concepts of, let me make that a bit bigger, you won't be able to see it, make it 24, make it even bigger, make it 28, there we go. Unconscious competence, I mean unconscious incompetence, unconscious incompetence. So what does that mean, unconscious incompetence? Well, it means you don't know what you don't know. So you go along in life very happily thinking that you're doing fine, everything's going well, and all of a sudden you realize that there's something that you don't know. Then you reach that next level, which is
unconscious incompetence. So you're still not very good at something, but you know that you're not good at it. So you go and look for information, you go and find um, maybe YouTube videos, maybe you have to fix your motorbike and there's something broken, you don't understand it. Um, to begin with, you didn't even know it existed. Now you know it's there and it's broken and you've got to fix it and you know you can't fix it. So that is reaching that level of conscious incompetence. You don't know. First off, you don't know what you don't know. Then you know what you don't know. And this is sort of the stages of learning and the stages of confidence. Then you go up a little bit higher and you get to the concept that you have conscious competence. This means you know what you know. This is actually a really good level to be at because you know what you know, you know how to share that information and if something goes wrong, you actually understand a bit more about where you can find some more information. So you've got this conscious competence level. Then the next level up is unconscious competence. And this means you do it right, but you don't know how you did it. So has anybody ever written a math test and got to the right answer, but didn't know how they got there? They got the right answer and the teacher says, that's great, show me your work. And you lose points because you didn't show your work because you have no idea how you got the right answer. It was just there. So that's the concept of unconscious competence. That's good. I can stand up now. So this means that we, throughout our lives of learning and knowledge, are going through these different levels of incompetence to competence. We always start off pretty much at that unconscious incompetence. We don't really know what we don't know. Then you get to realize, ooh, there's something out there called maritime autonomous surface ships. I didn't even know they existed. I need to know a bit more about that. So you get to the level that you're consciously incompetent. Now, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing being incompetent. It's just that term. Everyone sort of thinks it's negative. A bit like disruptive technologies. People think they're bad. They just think things are different. When you're consciously incompetent, it means that you're a really effective learner because you're going to go seek knowledge. You're going to go out and find experiences and learn to move up to that level of being consciously competent. The conscious competence level is what I call the sweet spot because you're excited about what you're doing. For those who were here earlier, you're in the flow. You're in that concept of flow theory. You are constantly challenging yourself to increase your skill, but at a level that is comfortable. You're not, you're not getting too scared. You're not over observing. You're, you're not getting bored. So you're staying in that flow. That's that concept. So that's a really great place. If you reach unconscious competence, you might think, oh, I want to be there. Um, that's actually kind of scary because you actually just do things because you always do it because you know it works. When things change, what you did before that always worked now won't work and you don't know why. So those are I wasn't planning to do that. Those are really those are your definitions of learning and knowledge. It sort of came to mind that this could be a really useful tool to know. Each of those levels exist. If you reach if you start at unconscious competence, if you get to the point where you're doing something because you've always done it that way because you know it's going to work, step back and think, why does it work? And if things change, will it still work? But I do think that conscious competence is that sweet spot to stay in, and I think you wanted to say something. So I think we go with it. What do you think it's a cycle? Like, after reaching unconscious competence, we will go back to unconscious incompetence again, because we find something that we don't know about. Yeah. Uh, how and uh, we'll just figure out that oh we don't know the process so we'll go back to learning the process. Yeah, it could be it could be something that we do throughout all of our lives and we will always be we might be unconsciously competent at okay, driving home. Have you ever arrived home and you say, I don't remember going through that how did I get here? Because you just do it every day the same way. Or you walk somewhere and you always end up walking the same way every day. Maybe you don't even notice when something's changed. And uh, yeah, you will cycle around. I agree. Yeah. It's presented, it's presented as stages, but at any one point in your life, in one area you might be unconsciously competent, and another area you might be unconsciously incompetent, but you will be consciously competent at something else. With communities of experts and working together, we get more, with more diversity, we get more ideas, 
And some of we might say something and we think, oh, I didn't mean that. Oh, I don't. Tell me more. And that's actually a really great sign of leadership as well, to be able to realize that someone knows something else. We don't have to have all the answers. So it's a kind of a cool little concept, the levels of competence. Now, I'm going to put myself off timing. <laughs> So your ideas of knowledge and learning are right on the money. You've got that concept of what does it mean to learn, what does it mean to know, and how do you get that experience to bring it together. I want to talk a little bit about the Human Capital Project. I did a presentation on the human capital in shipping, and it's really important. We are capital. We always think of capital as being money, don't we? You think of capital as being money? We need capital to do something. We need humans to do things. Humans are just as <laughs> more important than that money. So the human capital. There is a World Bank human capital project. Uh, there were some messages that came out in 2021. Those are the key messages there. The human capital is a key driver of growth. You, your knowledge, your learning, sharing your experiences, your diversity is a key driver of growth. COVID-19 has had significant impact on health, education, jobs, and equality. I think that's pretty much a straight fact. We know that. We need to prioritize human capital investments. We need to prioritize you. IMU has prioritized you because your growth is where the future lies. Innovations and technology will help strengthen and support human capital. And that's really what we've been talking about all this week. It's a really interesting project. I have to read the updated report for 2022, but there's a lot coming out of this whole World Bank project. Now that's general, that's everybody in the world. Let's bring it down to maritime a bit. In, again, 2021, BIMCO and ICS, International Chamber of Shipping, so those who were here before will know what all these acronyms are. So BIMCO and the International Chamber of Shipping came out with a Seafarer Workforce Report. There would be a need for an additional 89,150 officers by 2026. That's a lot of people. And I think yesterday lots of people were concerned about their jobs. So we're, we're going to be talking about their time autonomous surface ships. But look at that. We need that experience. We need those people. The current shortfall of STCW officers are there. And opposite categories are in short supply. Technical experience, managerial levels. So we need management, we need technical, we need operational. The industry needs you as human capital. We're going to go more general again, but how do you get that human capital? How do you do your learning in an environment where everything changes? I have an iPhone 6. It's always, oh, it isn't, it's not plugged into the power pack right now. That means the battery is going down like a stove. Uh, what version is iPhone up to now? 14 out of 6. Okay, so how am I going to keep updated if I can't keep my own equipment updated? How are we going to manage the rate of change? Everything's changing so fast. How can we learn? New equipment comes on a ship. Where's my training course? X just comes out. Where's my training course? How are we going to keep ourselves updated? I want to show a short video from the OECD, and they've done a lot of work on this. They call it the Learning Compass. It's suitable for all levels of trainers, uh, I mean of students, and it's been developed by students, educators, uh, basically a whole policymaker section as well. They've come up with this idea of a Learning Compass. I'm just going to show the short video. or in astronomers, the OECD Learning Compass indicates how students can navigate through an uncertain and rapidly changing ecosystem to help shape the future we want. It is an evolving learning framework 
that helps create a common language and understanding about broad educational goals. Co-created by policymakers, researchers, school leaders, teachers, and students from around the world, the OECD Learning Compass defines the competencies made up of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values that students need to fulfill their potential and to contribute to the well-being of their communities and the planet. When a student holds the learning compass, he or she is exercising agency, the capacity to set a goal, reflect, and act responsibly to effect change, to act rather than be acted upon. But the student is not alone in this. He or she is surrounded by peers, parents, teachers, and the community, all of whom interact with and guide the student towards well-being. The learning compass shows that students need some core foundations before they can set off towards well-being. These include not only literacy and numeracy, but also data and digital literacy, physical and mental health, and social and emotional foundations. To shape their future and the future of society, learners need to develop certain transformative competencies. These are defined as the ability to create new value, reconcile tensions and dilemmas, and take responsibility for their own actions. These competencies are developed through a cyclical learning process, anticipating, acting, reflecting. As learners become more adaptive and reflective and take actions accordingly, they continually improve their way of thinking. While there may be many visions of the future we want, the well-being of society is a shared destination. The OECD Learning Compass orients learners of all ages towards that better future. So the OECD Learning Compass actually has a lot of the same comments that you brought out in your discussions on learning and knowledge, doesn't it? It's that reflection, it's that action, it's bringing those together. In, in past years, education was all about knowledge, skills, and attitude, and it still is, but now they've added in values from that concept. And the need to have those transformative skill sets, those aspects of the fact that learning and knowledge go hand in hand forever, and you will not get a training program on every new piece of equipment that comes on a ship, on every new software program that comes to you. You won't. And, and don't expect it. Because you need that digital literacy to understand how to learn yourself, how to grow, how to share with your knowledge, with your experiences that you have. So the OECD learning compass is for all ages, um, me included. I'm learning a lot every single day. I've learned a lot from you. Let me just get that off the screen. Back to here. Um, but it can actually go all the way back. This is the OEC Learning Compass looking to 2030. 20, um, Ages ago, there was a gentleman by the name of Jean Piaget, and I quoted him yesterday, but he's got some great quotes. Teaching means creating situations where structures can be discovered. So the concept of the OECD Compass. The results of your discussion on learning and knowledge link back to the concepts that we need environments where we can discover. We can discover what it is we need. I can't tell you what it is that we need, but I can hopefully help you on that process of reflecting, of discussing, of getting to those structures to understand what it is that you will need in the future. And I think it's important that we take that ownership, and it came up in that OECD video. We need to take ownership for what it is that we do, who we are, and what our learning is. It's not something that happens to us, learning, teaching, training. It's something that we are an integral part of. So it's a really, really interesting concept that we have that's coming. Now, some of these are very broad, global concepts. Let's see if we can bring in a little bit now down into the maritime environment. Learning and training in maritime. 
How do we understand SPCW? Does anybody actually look at SPCW? Here, who's actually looked at the convention itself, the SPCW? Anybody? Yeah, good, excellent. It's um, entertaining to read, isn't it? Are you the only one? Does anyone else look at SPCW? Oh, good, we've got someone over there as well. Okay, other people, yes, it's good. You have to get your nose into this. This is your regulations. This is what governs what you learn. You need to know what's in it. So, who's looking at SPCW wants to talk about what they've seen in it? When you look at SPCW, what do you find? What, what's in SPCW? Yeah. I'll let him go first. So, when I opened it and looked at it, it had many chapters and what I looked at was the chapter of watchkeeping. We had to learn about that in class, uh, our actual research class. And uh, we had just to go through it and there were a lot of regulations and standards that we have to meet and uh, the things that we have to do when we are on board a ship while we are keeping watch and I'm focusing on watch keeping here and also the requirements to go there to be a watch keeper and also to be a deck character or an engine character or yeah, stuff like that. Excellent. There's a lot in there. So I've, I've just got a little excerpt from a table there but they're all set up this way. So there's general provisions, there's clarifications, there's definitions. It's a really, really good document to get your, your, get around your in your head to understand the definitions especially. Then there's mandatory standards and there's recommended levels, so recommended guidance. And you've got these tables. And the tables are set up, you can't read them very well from the back. This is a table from uh, PSSR, Model Course 1.21. It will become Model Course 1.21, but it's from the concept of what's in the table to support personal safety and social responsibility. So it talks about competence. And the competence is written in a certain active manner. Then it talks about knowledge, understanding, and proficiency. There's a column on methods for demonstrating competence and criteria for evaluating competence. So these are the tables as set out in the SDCW. This is what's governing what you're learning from that point of view. And in the management group, you will have a curriculum that will have been set. And that's, that curriculum is set. There are model courses, and they are there for guidance only. The STCW tables form what is included in a model course. And that's under the IMO structure. And who remembers how the IMO is set up? Who wants to tell me a bit about how the IMO is set up? Anyway, remember the IMO, the structure of the IMO? That was a few days ago. Yes. So IMO comes under the United Nations and IMO has several committees and under these committees have several sub subcommittees. So if you have to take something up to the IMO, you have to start with the subcommittee and then there will be discussions and meetings and then they will take it up with the committee and then there will be this little kind of something. Okay, excellent. And, and I'm trying to get that up so that you understand the structure and how the SDCW changes. Because a lot of people are saying we need to change SDCW. And that's really lovely in words. Um, the process could be a lot more difficult. What's really interesting though is that these tables are reviewed on an ongoing basis. And they are reviewed under a process that's in MSC, MEPC 2, Circular 15, Rev, actually coming up to Rev 2 soon. Rev 2 will be issued probably, it was agreed about four weeks ago, Rev 2 of this document, but it's not yet published. I did check the IMO. So these are the process to develop, review, and validate model courses. So once you get the SDCW updated, in order for the training to get done, you have to update the model courses next. So the STCW tables are what drive the training, the model courses. The STCW is a convention. So it goes through the revisions, will go through a subcommittee, a committee, to the IMO assembly, 
And as a convention, it will also have to go to some sort of diplomatic conference. The um, STCW convention was, about, was amended in 2020, 2010 in Manila. So the Manila amendments, you might have heard of those. It, it provides the process. There's a priority for review of courses. They've got one to four. They have a four-step process under that to develop and review model courses which includes first off getting it on the agenda for review. So the very first thing, you have to go to a committee to get on the agenda so they can talk about it. Uh, and that's the structure of the IMO to ensure this oversight structure. Um, and it's very structured. Are you seeing any challenges now with what the OEC, the learning compass, was telling us? And the process by which SDCW is updated, and our curriculum, almost every curriculum, university curriculum has, has very similar process that goes through to ensure the quality of the training. You see any challenges here? It's not happening that fast as it should be. Like a lot of things we are seeing has gotten outdated even though they are very basic. But the thing is that according to how the learning compass asks us to be, you know, cognitively active with you know changes happening rapidly around us, it's really hard for us to keep up with the current model courses. So I think like with the core interesting courses about uh, fire safety, uh, personal safety, and first aid and other training, I think one of the most important courses that should be there in every organization for that matter is how to develop cognitive thinking or how to analyze risk. Because if you can't analyze risk, you can't actually, you know, uh, respond to it. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, okay, yeah, great, great, great. There are some real challenges that are faced, and it's not just the maritime industry, it's every industry, because things are changing so rapidly, and that OECD compass gives us a guidance. But did you hear what they were saying? As the student holds the compass in their hand, so it really comes down to us as learners, us as students, us as human beings working in a society where everything is changing to take ownership. And I think we have time. So this is a big question. This is going to take more than five minutes, I can guarantee you. Uh, in your table, I want you to consider the vision of future training from the OECD. So keeping that in mind, what we saw, the changes that you see in the industry, I want you to talk about the changes that you're seeing in the industry and, and include in that the speed of the changes that you have. Um, so what's changing in the industry? Identify three challenges you see or are experiencing right now in training as a maritime professional for the future. So what are, what are the things that are challenging you as a maritime professional in the future? And then think about what you can do to address those challenges, options that you have. Um, for those who have done the circles of influence and the circles of concern, you can use a circle if you want. Otherwise, you can just do a table with challenges and options to address. Um, these options to address don't necessarily need to be you personally. These can be options on a more broad level, something that might be that you need to influence some change at a higher level. Are there any questions on the task set you? Any questions? I'm nodding the head, shaking the head. Any questions? I'm looking for eye contact. Any questions? No. Okay, good. Um, off you go. I will I will check in after about eight minutes and see how you're doing. I want to leave enough time at the end to take up this and I would like every table to have a chance to speak on this item. Okay, over you.
What do you think of the shipping industry? How will you perceive how much they want? I'm keen about how people want to do this. There's a really stuff. You can also Google, just Google e commerce maritime or maritime free. Yes, maritime e commerce to see what are within the the training environment, what are you learning? Are you learning about these aspects of e-commerce? Is there something that you need to learn about? Or is there a challenge that you're facing with with your school? Okay. So the biggest thing I think is critical thinking skills and we need to just discuss those ideas. This group of four that we can just get one challenge and one or two options to address that challenge. How are you guys doing? Are you all there? They're all men. Yeah, but we, I think they need to think of the air time. I feel like we have some of the air time. We have so much to do with air time. Just because it will bring them to the air time. Are you happy with that? Okay. Are you happy if you switch with somebody from that table so we get one air time for a second? Lisa, it's very interesting. Okay, so who wants to switch? Are you happy to switch? Who's happy to switch? Okay, one person switch. Okay, good. Thank you. It just brings a different perspective, more diversity. I think most people are done. You guys up here aren't done, I know. We had a big long discussion to get you started on. Is anyone else not yet done? Okay, we got a group up there who's not done either. I'll give you two more minutes, okay? Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay, I think you should all be done by now. 
Let's go through. I'm going to start at the back and work my way forward. I want one challenge and one option or one solution from each table. Okay? One challenge and one solution. Coming to the back. Let's go to the back. We'll work our way forward. Let's we'll start with you guys. Who's speaking? Someone who didn't speak before. So who spoke before you spoke before? So someone else. Okay. Okay, so if everyone could be quiet, we're going to start hearing from the tables. That means I want people quiet. Are we ready? We've got some conversations still going a little bit too loudly. You can't listen if you're talking. Okay, who's speaking? Uh, so, uh, Mr. Uh, and that is a huge challenge, the new types of fuels, and how do they work in the old engines, so you're going to need to fix those engines, design new engines. Um, so if anyone wants to start working on designing engines to use new fuels, lot to work in that environment. Okay, who's next? You are. Who's speaking? Someone who hasn't spoken before, and you're both looking like you want to speak. So who hasn't spoken before? Okay. Um, the mission of OECD is uh, to talk education and skills, aims to help educate this complete community knowledge, skills, attitude, and values of students. We to try uh, in and shape the in their future. And uh, the difficulty, uh, the conditions are uh, difficulty or difficult to change in updation of system uh, in automatic systems. And the solution that we are uh, supposed is that uh, Adatol is the key of the solution to this problem. And Sami passioning and instills uh, and another lesson for upgrading. Well, it's hard sometimes to be able to talk, isn't it? Well done. It's part of the learning I want to give you as well is that your voice is important. Everyone has a voice. Every student here should be confident to speak up and to share that, share their ideas. Well done. Now, who is over here? Who's speaking? Yeah, Janusz, okay, we part. So, I and then from a training point of view, that means that you're going to need to know about those things, right? And a solution could be that you could work with industry and get industry in to provide training on what the fuels are like and how they're going to be implemented. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to this table next. Who speaks? Good morning. One of the challenges faced by the OECD community is shipyard capacity management. And the solution for this is building more number of shipyard having better capacity. That was very good. Yes. Building better capacity for the ships. Uh, 
thinking about how you might do that, that's, that's the next level of, of solution that we need to come up with. Okay, you're speaking? Good morning, everyone. Uh, the challenges faced that we have not described. The fossil change in the industry and technical aspects of the industry is changing rapidly. So, yeah. it gives less time for the professionals to adapt and uh, take the happening up with the community. So, uh, the solution is like uh, creating awareness among the professionals to upgrade and update their technical skills and to pop up with the growing and doing development to the things. Well said, well done. And, and it's not, I think the biggest thing coming out of that is that in order to keep up skill with, you can't wait for people to tell you you're going on a training course. Um, and you won't have training courses for stuff. You don't have training courses for your iPhones or your next Android phone or your computers, really. So why would we need training for every single piece of equipment? People will share. Next. Good morning, Mark. Um, our challenge is the lack of interest by many persons to engage in the higher industry and the solution for this is proper awareness among young people about higher tech. I'm going to ask a bit more about proper awareness. Proper awareness, awareness more of the uh, citizens do not possess much idea about the higher industry. Uh, so we took proper awareness by where you can go like online sessions with these Excellent. So I just want to get closer to the more practical. So online session, practical awareness, the maritime industry. When I was when I went to become a cadet at Coast Guard College, I'd never heard of the Canadian Coast Guard College. Um, I was told to go to university, I was told to get a degree. I didn't even know there was an option to go into the maritime industry. I fell into it by accident. Uh, and it's been the best accident ever, but why? Why are we not all aware of this amazing industry? So, let's share the information. I'm going to this table next. Who's next? Good morning, all. The challenge we talk about is uh, coming autonomous shapes. As the future is uh, going to be autonomous uh, in the world, uh, we, are faced, we are going to, we are also concerned about our jobs. We are going to face lack of opportunities uh, in the shipping industry. As the autonomous ships are coming, and the service that we are following is uh, modern day service, we are not updated, up to the technologies. So, what we concern of is that uh, in future, or uh, in present, we should start training for what we need in future. That's our solution. And it's, it's really a good solution, except for the fact that I can't tell you what you're going to need in the future, so I can't train you for that. But what we can train you for is how to think critically about what you will need in the future so you can find the learning that you need. And we live in an environment and it, a time actually that's unprecedented with information available through the internet and knowledge. So if you have a question about something, go check online and see what there is, but think critically about the source that you're looking at. Um, is it a Wikipedia that's been, that somebody throwing some ideas out or is it actually a website that's worth looking at? So critical thinking is, is a really big one. We can train you, we can teach you to learn and the importance of lifelong learning, but it's up to you. It really is. Okay, next. Good morning, everyone. The challenge we want to talk about is uh, technological change, rapid digitalization, and technological advancement in the shipping industry means that uh, crews need to be trained more regularly in operations of increasingly complex systems and second half we have lack of training professionals and uh, lack of awareness and is there a solution there's a solution i want a solution who gave you a solution okay let's, let's work on a solution together then for that um let's take the word of lack of training professionals oh that's a tough one so how are we going to get more training professionals in the maritime industry. Any ideas? What can we do? Yes. Oh, just a second. I got someone from the table themselves. You've got an idea? No. Okay. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, retired professionals from the industry or the people who are senior to the 
look up us. So what they can do is on like on a regular basis they can do an experience sharing session where they can do talk about the other like you know possible things that are coming up. What is not? So that way I think like you know the gap between knowledge and information will reduce drastically. Thank you. That's one option. That's a great option. Another option could be that each one of you, when you go out on a ship, can be mentoring somebody else. So there's mentoring. We don't necessarily need to have a complete instructor there to help with this. Uh, you can have search out a mentor, someone who can help you. I think one of the issues, and I feel it very acutely, is it's been a long time since I went to sea. Uh, in order for me to tell you what you need on a ship, I remember what it was like when I was on a ship in the 1980s. Things have changed a lot. So the option, I think, is that we need to reach out and we need to have sessions online or opportunities to connect with on LinkedIn, those who are in the industry right now. And that's what I really try to do, is to make sure I stay up to date. Because it's been a long time. And things change. And it's hard for me to keep up to date with it all. I can imagine as things change, it's going to be hard for you as well. But get connections, get networks. Everyone here is part of your network. And you can all share your experiences. Okay, this table. Now, this table is a tough one. Because you have a speaker there. I uh, come over this side where I'm standing because it doesn't. If I put the microphone over there, you're going to get a lot of feedback. And it's really hard on our ears. We've learned that over the past few days. Morning, everyone. The challenges in the maritime industry, uh, new technologies and innovations are upcoming like updates in propulsion of the ships like wheels and etc. And the solution is currently we have standards uh, that are minimal to the old ones. So we should need new standards of trading. Thank you. I want to get new standards of training too. Who's speaking? Good morning, everyone. The challenge we discuss in our group is uh, although SDCW uh, is a course that uh, offers safety management courses, but the persons don't have the ability to assess the risk unless and until they are exposed to it. That is, they don't have stress management ability. To address this course, uh, we got a solution that uh, stress management courses can be uh, given to the people that will help them how to act upon fight and flight responses. Very good. Very good. Next group. Um, and, and comment on that. We're working on it. We're working on it. We'll see. We'll see how long it takes to get there. But there is a proposal to change the PSSR model course that will include aspects of that. We've been in that process now for a year and a half, so this is the IMO. The changes if you want to see in this industry is use of IoT sensors in the search and desk operations and also communication and accurate positioning and also utilization of smart drones for real time operation. So we have a challenge that how will be gonna use this place. How we to get more information on how we are gonna deal with this and uh, to work with this new equipment and training standards. So, we saw people saying you should add this to syllabus and we will get to know about it. What we want to give a solution is instead of adding everything to syllabus, we can, IMO can take this initiative in creating new apps and websites which is give a material or a source and keep on updating that material on basis of new technologies so that the person who really requires that material will get access and will gain the knowledge from that specific technology. I love the idea of the IMO developing an app that gives you the updates. Um, we know the IMO website gives you information on what they're working on, but an app that would provide you with updated information in a micro-learning environment, um, then we need it. So when something changed, then you get an app that tells you that you need it and you can work your way through it. Um, that's probably worth following up on um, as a cohort, perhaps. Maybe you could talk to your instructors, put together a bit of a proposal, and have it sent up because the IMO is doing work with younger members and looking to get the input from the youth. So I'm looking at Captain Vinod, Naveen, Captain Naveen. So the students might have an idea for an app for the IMO. 
to help keep the young people updated on the changes and give them training rather than selling them on training courses. I think that was you. I think it was you guys. I'm hoping there will be some change that will come out of this section. Who's next? Who hasn't spoken? Okay, I'll let you go. <laughs> Uh, from the video, we I, what we understood one thing uh, among the core foundations of OECD is data and digital literacy. Uh, if everyone uh, 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 just saying, the data and digital literacy is one of the one of the challenges which we are taking today. Data and digital uh, literacy, more of a visualized learning, is what is a challenge for all the uh, nautical students present over here. And then the second challenge. Is what we are taking is getting updated. Updated. You know, there are new technologies invented every second. It is being implemented every second too. Getting updated to it is very difficult. At the same time, if you're not getting updated to it, the maintenance, operation of all these equipment is going to be difficult. So that is one of the challenges. And other challenge is zero emissions. Of course, emission has always been a problem in the maritime sector. So that is one of the challenges. The options which we have taken to reduce it is more of a digital learning, digital literacy. Digital learning must be uh, implemented. Visualized learning must be implemented. It is important. It is of immense importance. And then getting updated. The shipping company updates its equipment. It must also take the initiative of training its crew members on the update which is there. Only then operation and maintenance can be done as such. And zero emissions, as my friend sitting over in that group mentioned, alternate fuels is implemented. But it is of no use if alternate engine for that particular fuel is not implemented. So these three are the options to uh, reach the challenges. Very good. And actually, I'm going to, I'm going to take your, your solution about the training when the new equipment comes and link it back to your other. Uh, so there's a link in the visual learning and online and that app concept as well. I'm starting to see a bit of uh, some threads that are joining together here that we could have training that would be provided through a digital environment in a structured format but online so you don't have to go away to a training institute to be trained. You can be trained in the material and the equipment and the information you need in that just-in-time approach. So when you need it, it's there and you can get trained on it. Okay. Second last group is here, I think. Who's speaking? I thought they decided who was going to speak. Who's speaking? Here. <laughs> you have the microphone. Speak into the microphone. <laughs> You have the mic, you can speak. You've got the notes, speak. You can do it. <laughs> I've got a topic of uh, marine pollution. Uh, for the upcoming year of leadership, uh, the infra infrastructure and engines are existing, already needs to be replaced. Um, the challenges are availability and storage of fuels. The solution is uh, we can change. Pass the mic to the You should say this. We've got the solution in mind. Well, the solution is our European storage of fuels and the alternate should be used for the solution should be. Okay. Well done. And the solution making into the storage of these tools. So, from a learning point of view, a training point of view, what are the options and who's going to design those those aspects of the, how you're going to store these fuels? So well done. Next group. Last group. Last but not least. Good morning, guys. So challenges faced by the maritime industries and then lack of practical knowledge. As my two uh, friends said, uh, visualized knowledge is important. Um, like that, practical knowledge is more important than that. For this uh, solution is to give practical classes to the students, like CFIRS, that is the uh, main solution for them. And to, to sort of bring all of those, it's very well done. Everyone's had an excellent uh, discussion. I hope that's all part of it as well. 
Oh, we have one more comment here. Yes. One second. But she has. And uh, you know, see, it's like uh, I am old. I am like comes under like a for an oil rig or not. There's an oil rig ships around there. So is it comes under like a I am take actions for that or is there a different committee, uh, committee will be taking action for that? So the question is regards to oil rigs, yeah, not yeah. FPSOs. So yeah, we're, what's interesting actually with oil rigs is that we're going to wake more oil. So what's going to happen with the oil rigs? Uh, that's that's a whole other question. I, one of my mentees was working on that, and suggesting they can be turned into sort of like alternative fuel gas stations. <laughs> so ships can pull up to what was an oil rig, and they can refuel. Um, at the rate, so that's an interesting concept. Um, where do they come under? I have to take that on notice. I'm not sure. There is a rig, what's the name of the organization that manages? There's an international group that manages oil rigs, and I don't have the acronym on the top of my tongue right now, but I can take that on notice. When it comes to the concept of uh, drawing the threads together for the training aspect, is practical visualized training available ideally using the digital tools that we use every day up to date somehow manage to ensure it's accurate so you aren't getting the wrong information um, the suggestion was maybe IMO could take this on or IMO could put it to the World Maritime University uh, and the World Maritime University does a lot of work in this area looking at different solutions to the problems so I think you've got some really great ideas. You might want to take those ideas further as a cohort, talk about them more, flesh it out a bit more, and see if there's an actual proposal that can go forward. And perhaps you, in this class, can influence change that will then be something that all seafarers can benefit from, because uh, everyone uses the apps. Thank you very much for that session. I've got one last little slide before we go for tea. I know you're a bit late. Uh, now, I did say, show you the results of the key demands from youth. Uh, they're very hard to read. I'll leave it up there during coffee break so you can come up and read it. The key demands from youth was a workshop that was held in Malaysia. And they had three focus questions. And I would love to do that with this group, but we don't have time. But the questions were very similar to what we've done just now, though. What do you want to see changed or improved? How do you propose these things can be improved? And why do you think changing these will lead to a better career progression? Um, so I'm going to leave those up there. They are an outcome from a workshop that my, my friend Yuen led, or was part of, in Malaysia. And some really great comments, very similar to us. Some of them are very specific to Malaysia, but I think you'll be able to find um, aspects that are similar. For example, benchmarking. Immersion programs for faculty members. I, I did say it's been a long time since I've been to see. I have to keep myself updated somehow. And that's through leading workshops and talking and working with those who are on ships right now. It definitely is coffee break time. Do you want to say something that you're standing here for? Okay. So to read body language here. <laughs> you're very good at it. <laughs> so, um, we love them raise this uh, thing about IMO, IMO. So I have a good news from IMO. Um, those who were here before, I think on Tuesday, we had a shot on uh, Heroic Iden. Do you remember the ship Heroic Iden? Yeah. The seafarers who are illegally detained. Okay. So the situation is still bad for the seafarers. So that's what we were trying to gather, muster as much support as possible. So we had a candidate on Wednesday in Marine Drive, and a lot of people all over our country are involved. So um, I thought I'll do a bit of what I can do. So I wrote an email to IMO on Tuesday. So just when Gillian was on the session, I just got a reply from IMO's office from the Secretary General because both of us think the Secretary General, current Secretary General is a good friend of us. And he did prove that he's a good friend because he's replied to our mail, Mr. T. Tatlin. So the reply says that um, the IMO is aware. I just wanted to find out because sometimes there's a communication gap. Uh, we think everybody knows, but they might not know. So the 
question that I raised was, are you aware of this incident that's happening and are you doing something about it? So they have given very precise answers, they are saying yes, we are aware of this incident and we are working on it. Good. So that's a good thing. Yeah. And, and this good news, um, as soon as I got the email, I just sent it across to the chief officer who is on the ship and he's given me a thumbs up. So you can imagine that these kind of views, how motivating it will be for them, right? Okay, now it is tea time and I'm a little bit over time, but mass is really exciting. So how long do you guys need to keep? Ten minutes? Is ten minutes good enough? Ten? You were going to say five. I love it. That was great. Someone's going to say, oh, give me ten minutes. Fifteen. Someone says fifteen. You must have fifteen. Okay, take your fifteen minutes. I will give you fifteen. But fifteen means... 13, because you're back in here, ready to start in 15 minutes, which will be, the time will be 11.31. Be here at 11.29. We will start at 11.31. <laughs> Last game on quite a journey. When can we meet you again? <laughs> Online anytime. Yeah, uh, you live in Sydney. Right? I live in Canada. Yeah. So how far is that? Because uh, I have a couple of friends who stay in Sydney. Oh, do you? So it's a three and a half hour drive. Okay. If, I'm yeah. coming, then if you come, you let me know. And come up. I sometimes go down to Sydney, not a lot. I'm, I'm sometimes in Sydney. I book you Oh, oh I love it. We want to see something. Ah, oh, yes, oh, you can teach my husband that how to cook. Perfect. So I've been doing this for quite a while now. That's why my parents have left me alone. Yeah. Yeah, I'm an artist as well, history. Yeah. So I made such an artist. Oh, look good. Look at that. So yeah, right. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, the thing is like, uh, I have a couple of friends in Sydney, they are working with marketing. I do work with marketing projects. Yeah. Like there's this company who gives a crap, they're into making toilet papers out of bamboo shoes. Okay. So yeah. I was working with them. Uh, like, is that who gives a crap? Yeah. Yeah, I use who gives a crap. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're our toilet paper. Yes, they are like... They are amazing. They're very fun. And actually, the toilet paper lasts forever. One box lasts us a year. Yeah, that's the thing. So they are going for an offline marketing campaign. Which okay. Which is supposedly going to start from uh, Christmas. Okay. So I was working uh, with one of my friends who was working with that. Yeah. So that's when I was like, oh, you're, you're from Australia. Yeah, I'm in Canberra. So uh, it's not too... It's not too far. It's a three and a half hour drive. You can rent a car. It's a free drive. Lots of nice places. Nice places. Left side uh, left or right? Uh, towards Melbourne. So inland a bit. Inland and towards Melbourne. So up towards the snowy mountains. It's a pretty drive. It's very good. I do want to go to I am a huge uh, white ethnicity. Both my parents are environmental scientists. Oh, what? Both my parents are environmental scientists. Oh, wonderful. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. yeah, I grew up in an environment where my yeah. mom's a botanist and my dad's a zoologist. Oh, but gosh. my dad's working in the military. Okay. So, and mom's a teacher, so she yeah. was a teacher. Oh. She just got a little sick and she couldn't cut Oh it. dear, I hope, I hope she's okay. Yeah, she's perfectly fine now. It's just yeah. that, like, she had a slip disc. Oh, yeah. So, it was that, like, it was very advised to rest for her. Yeah. And, uh, like, because me and mom were living alone because of dad's, you know, moving around. Okay, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, then, like, finally, because I finished my university, and after that, that's when I asked mom to go stay with dad, and I started. Managing things by myself. Oh, good. Well done. So that's the thing, like, uh, you know, like, I do want to visit Australia because of the biodiversity. Yeah. And because of Steve Evans. Well, ANU is up in Canberra. Uh, so, Australian National University is in Canberra, the premier university of Australia. So, what are the courses do they have? I want to apply for one of those courses. So, check online with ANU. I think they do some environmental aspects, there's no maritime. Um, but there is some law. There is some law. I mean, I have no time. I can have my teeth. Yeah, zero. I'll take my phone. I need my time. Did you connect it to the power guy? Pardon? Did you connect it to the power guy? Yeah, I need to. You're right, thank you. How much my battery at? Oh, I'm, I was connected, so I'm 82 now. I can handle it. It'll last for a couple of hours. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Okay. Oh, I'm just going to be here. 1131. Come on, guys. Time to go. Woo. Come on in. We're going to get started now. If they're still downstairs, just go yell down to them to come in now. What's that? One picture. Oh, okay. I'm coming. You're just doing this to delay it. What? Ah, do we change the slide to something else? Okay. Okay. What do you want me? Send something. Hold no. I have a second. I'll set a call then. There you go. Got it. Excellent. Right over. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Now, I don't know if anybody came up to look at this screen. I want to read up some of the things because I'm really, they're really, I think, in line with the number of things you've said. So please come on in and sit down. And then be quiet. You get your chance to talk, but not right now. So I did want to read out a few of the things on this slide because I think they're really interesting. Um, for education and training, they were saying that they want higher salaries to attract younger seafarer instructors. So they're saying that the instructors are older and they, they need to have, because often when you come ashore after being afloat, you see a reduction in your salary uh, because you're not working the overtime. You maybe you get you lose the uh, the salary levels that you would have if you come ashore. So a lot of instructors get paid less than the seafarers do. So the thought was to have higher salaries to attract those younger ones as instructors. Kind of a cool idea. Um, then the idea of shipboard rotations where faculty members have a minimum requirement of contracts to be allowed to teach. So trying to keep the instructors updated by having them rotate through. There are a number of industries that actually do this as well, that they have the instructional staff are rotating out, maybe not working on a ship, but actually rotating out and working on an area. Aviation comes to mind. Um, and then benchmarking, immersion programs with faculty members. And the other ones are more specific to the, oh, that's interesting though. So there's something specific to Malaysia, but it's following up on quality schools, benchmarking of the schools to be available in the public so that people are aware and to help raise awareness as well of the industry. Um, then it talked about recruitment and career progression. And they're saying you should actually have an emphasis in the age of 12, so the lower grades, should be taught about maritime, the industry. So they come out of high school, they already know about the maritime industry. Pretty cool idea. Um, and crewing agencies must also equip shore-based employees and seafarers alike. That's good news for the management groups. So the shipping companies, crewing agencies, have shore-based employees as well as uh, and actually understand what's happening. And then the human rights and welfare, cadets should have a dedicated onboard training officer. And that actually came as a surprise to me. Do you not have that? I did when I went to see. 
We had a dedicated, while I was on the shift, there was a dedicated officer for the cadets. There was only two of us. There wasn't much work on him, but there was a dedicated officer. Uh, and then a rebranding the seafaring profession as a noble profession. It is a noble profession. Does it need rebranding? But that's an interesting concept. And the other one was mainstreaming maritime other than just a news story when a ship capsizes, grounds, or accidents happen. Wouldn't it be great to have maritime in the mainstream news all the time? So those are some comments from other young people, just like you, in a workshop session focused on what the youth would demand from the industry. Uh, that slide will be in the slide deck as well. And I do have to thank uh, my friend Duran for giving that to me. And I wanted to read that through because nobody came up to look at it. <laughs> it's important. You need to know it. Okay, so we've had a break. We're moving into autonomous systems. Pretty cool. Autonomous systems. It's that cool idea, eh? It's out there somewhere. Maybe one day. Where's this table? Are there people at this table and that table? Where'd they go? Pardon? Oh, dear. What happened? Oh, oh dear. Oh, I better stay away from them then. Okay, autonomous systems. Automation, autonomous systems are all around us. So we think maybe autonomous systems are somewhere in the future, but they're all around us right now. So automation and autonomous systems. This is on a car I was driving one time. I rented it. My car's too old, it doesn't have this. Has anybody been in a car that has these great little systems when you back up? Little alerts, little alarms. It is an autonomous system. It actually tells you what you're doing, where you're going. It's a form of augmented reality. So augmented reality isn't something in the future. It's here right now. And it's been around for a while. This is a picture that came off of a LinkedIn, the same guy who gave the video last time on LinkedIn actually. He's a colleague of mine and in the Nautical Institute, he chairs the Autonomous Technology Advisory Group. So this is a ship he was piloting. Um, I hope you can read it. It says, that today I piloted a Japanese cape sized boat carrier that was trialing augmented reality technology. It's fantastic to see the development in the area. However, you also see the consequences of a ship transmitting erroneous AIS data, the headed input. So you can see he's got a heads up display on the screen, on the window, when he looks out, they've got this information. Have you seen this before on any of the your, your social media? This is really this came from last year, actually. And you can see there is some erroneous heading information. See the types? <laughs> They're pointed that way, but the image is pointing that way. Um, but, and in terms it could be, right? Because the way the Z dogs work on a tug, it might be going the opposite way to what it is, but it was just an interesting observation. But that exists. This is the stuff that's here now. So I'm going to get you to pull out your phones, and we're going to do a minty. We're talking about maritime autonomous surface ships. What are mass? I'll leave the QR code up just for a second before I bring in the Menti itself. I'm not sure if it's actually active yet. Let me just get up into my Menti. Where's my Menti? Here it is. And we'll bring it over. Okay, hopefully people got the QR codes they want. Otherwise, just go to menti.com. I'm presenting it. There we go. Now it's presenting. Okay, so what are masks? If you didn't get the QR code, that's fine. Just go to menti.com. Menti.com and put in this code. Type in that code. So what are masks? Yeah, what are masks? Good. Okay, who's in Jenna? <laughs> okay. So what are masks? <laughs> are you autonomous, Jenna? 
Okay, seriously now though, what are maths? Okay guys, uh, yeah, what are maths? This is not giving me the answers I'm looking for. What are maths? What is a maritime autonomous surface ship? Okay, we're getting some more serious. I'm trying to be serious guys. I know it's hard. Saturday. Put your feet back on the ground. It's Saturday. Be serious. A surface ship is autonomous, it's dealing with automation. I like that one, that's good. Dealing with automation. Surface ships, yes, so the S is surface ship. So it's not a drone, and it's not a submarine. Are we getting some more serious ones coming in? Let me see. Okay, we're getting some more serious ones coming in. Me? Ah, multiple. So we've got multiple autonomous ships. We've got dealing with automation, maritime automation, good ones coming in, navigation, a ship system, AI powered. Ooh, I like that. AI powered. So we're getting some good ideas of what mass is. I'm going to be talking for the next few minutes about mass, and I'm going to show you some videos. Actually, I've got a couple of videos to show you, but I haven't even seen myself yet because they just popped in on my, my WhatsApp. Okay? Because this is how new it is. This morning, I contacted a colleague of mine who is working in the mass environment, and I said, I'm, I'm speaking, I want something up to date. My, my videos are from, you know, four or five months ago. That's how fast it's changing. And he said, she said, oh, okay, I was out there today. I'll send you some videos. So this raw video of some footage that she took yesterday. Okay, let's leave that. I'm going to push that over to the other side. We got some really good items now, and we're getting more serious ones coming up. Thank you. We'll have fun later. We'll have fun every day. Okay, I'm going to move that. It's still open. It just won't take long to board. So what are masks? Ships of, and shipping of tomorrow was one of the things that they were talking about at one time. Here is this concept of mass. And it's been a while though, actually. I'm just going to sit down for a bit, sorry, my legs are. In the 1970s, there was a book called Imagine a Ship Without a Crew. In the 1970s, this is before I even went to sea. That's a long, long time ago, guys. So in the 1970s, there was a book and it was called Imagine a Ship Without a Crew. In the 1980s, the Japanese had this intelligent ship project without a crew. So it's not actually all that new, is it, then, Mass? In the 1990s, there was a shipyard that built a ship without a crew. It came out in the 2000s, and there was an unmanned bulk carrier. Still, they speak about the concept, but it's not really out there yet. In 2013, Rolls-Royce had a a video that went out about the future version of a ship and a shore station. And in 2017, Switzer remotely controlled, which is now into the next phase, a mass vessel. So, mass is maritime autonomous surface ship. It's about automation. It's about AI. And it's about the challenges that we have in the industry as we move forward. Now, what do mariners think about mass? So we asked the same concept um, at a webinar that I did with the Autonomous Technology Advisory Group online. This is the sort of thing they came back with. How do you feel about technology in shipping? Opportunity, good, reliability, efficiency, training, empowering, interested. Isn't it nice to know that people are excited about this, not just scared? you should be excited. So what are masks? Let's take a look at a few types of masks. All these vessels in some manner have some form of autonomy. So mass is not just a vessel without anybody on board. It's the concept of autonomy. And there's more. So what are masks? 
we're getting now into this concept of some sort of remote control aspect of it. But we've had those in engine rooms for ages. We've had uncrewed engine rooms for a long time. So autonomy is all around us. And this is from my colleague who works in OI. This is the concept of scaling up. I'm sorry, I've got my WhatsApp on and that's probably the bell going. Let me turn it off for a second. There we go. So scaling up OI developments. This is what they had. So that's a little vessel. Let me double check how long that one is. That vessel is... They are scaling up to 10 times their size. Oh, that's right. So it's about, these ones are about 7 meters. This one's 78 meters. So that's what they're doing. And they're building, they're, they're in the process of building those. So these guys, I've got a video of that. I think maybe the, the granddaddy, that's the granddaddy, maybe the the father of that's coming up soon, the bigger one, slightly bigger. The centralized operation and on-hand experience is being developed, but it's still human-centric. There's still somebody involved in the process. They are actually looking at remotely controlled vessels. So not 100% autonomous moving on its own with nobody in charge, but remotely controlled. And the remote control center, I think I've got a picture of it later. So we've got 17 uncrewed robotic vessels that are being built now in a range of 21 to 78 meters. And my, my friend's actually going to see them in the build in Vietnam. They have 20 proposed remote control centers. 20. So this is serious business. It's really exciting what's happening, and it's something that you should be excited about and not concerned about. We had some discussion yesterday about people being afraid of losing their jobs because of autonomous service ships. But actually, it's really exciting. And there are lots of areas, this is the quotes, hopefully you can read them, but you can see some of the different sizes of vessels underway. Mass market is currently worth 1.1 billion annually. It's expected to go up and, and increase by almost 7% in 2025. That's in like three years. It's a huge, huge business. Robotics and autonomous systems are at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution, currently transforming industry and jobs. And we were talking about those industrial revolutions. We're really now almost into the fifth industry 5.0. So it's getting, it's getting bigger. IMO has been involved in this for a number of years. The IMO regulatory scoping exercise for mass took about five years to get done. And what they did is they reviewed every single convention of which there are many under the IMO to see what would have to change in a mass environment, or if anything would need to change in a mass environment. So it's a very long exercise. For that exercise, they identified four degrees of mass. And I'm going to read them up because they're awfully small. A ship with an automated process and decision support is level one. Okay, what ship out there does not have an automated system on it? Every ship has an AIS, an autopilot, a cross-tack error alert. So basically all the ships that are out there right now are level one on that mass scale. Then level two, remotely controlled ship with seafarers on board. So seafarers are on board to take control to operate systems. The ship is controlled and operated from another location. That's a huge jump. These regulatory scoping exercise categories missed so much in the middle. I'm hoping they're going to put these aside and come up with something a little bit more refined. The next one is remotely controlled ship without seafarers on board, which is where OI are going. And the final one is a fully autonomous vessel that makes its own decisions. It uses AI and machine learning based on algorithms to just do its work. Now, 
There aren't many of those right now. And there are, you'll see in the news, some people will say we are fully autonomous. However, they're being overseen, those oversight is still happening. But those are the four categories. And they're all linked to the fact that we have advances in automation. So something that's operator controlled. There used to be somebody on the helm, but now we have autopilot. And we are continuing to move forward with track pilot, DP, DP autopilot, dynamic positioning. This is this, this is nothing new. This is already there. We had manual radar plotting at one time. Then we would get manual RPOP target acquisition. And now we have radar guard zone, auto RPOP acquisition. And you can even put the name on it when you have it merged with the AIS targets. This is this. This is nothing new. You should be noting this already, actually, because it's been around for a while. Maneuvering a vessel. It's a big wheel. And they went to this concept of a joystick with a heading control on it. So you sort of set it up and it moves along with that. And now we've got DP auto positioning, dynamic positioning, auto positioning. Pretty cool. We used to manually <laughs> put a fix on a paper truck. Anybody still put a fix on a paper truck? Do you do that? Yeah, you do that in your training? Yeah. Now, for a number of years now, the IMO has said that you don't need paper charts on board if you have an ECTUS and a backup. In the BTS world, yes, we used to teach them how to put fixes on paper charts. We've now taken that out of the curriculum because nobody does it anymore. Um, knowing about lines of position is really important, but we have this automatic DNSS ECTUS fixing. Back in the day, you used to carry a radio officer. I remember actually the radio operator was using a Morse code to contact my parents so I could tell them I was going to miss my uncle's funeral. Um, you know, we really didn't have a lot of communication. That I had to go to the captain to get permission to send that message. So he said it's radio operator. Now we have a DSC watch. We don't have radio operators on ships anymore. But we have technical officers who can fix the equipment. And everyone has to be trained on understanding how the equipment works and when something's not working as expected. So a lot of it is around what do we expect to happen. So when we think about automation, when we think about autonomous vessels, it's the next evolution. It's not a transformation. It's not something that hasn't been thought of before. If go back to the 1970s people were thinking about it. So we're now, earlier I was talking a little bit about Isaac. Asimov and science fiction of the, the 50s and the 60s is now science fact. So the ideas and the dreams that we have back then are becoming fact. The ideas and dreams that you have today can become fact, but probably a lot faster because of the changes in technology. So we need to equip ourselves to be maritime professionals in a digital age. Collective awareness. You are all part of a cohort. You are all part of an industry. A float and a shore, you are maritime professionals. You have a collective awareness. You learn from each other. Diversity brings in new thoughts and new ideas, and it's an opportunity for you to learn. You need to upgrade your skill sets continuously. So it goes into continuous learning. I thought I'd turn that off. What I want to do before I get into the next things, I want to show you some real recent videos of autonomous vessels in action. Just one second. I will turn off my what's for a minute. Okay, just bear with me while I bring up my WhatsApp. And there it is. Okay, so my colleague sent me these videos this morning. And we're just going to go through them. It's just a, a trial of an autonomous vessel in Southampton, just outside of Southampton. Turn the volume down just a second. It's just a noise in the background. You don't need to hear the engines. Just a second. Uh, Can you turn the volume down a bit for me? Just we don't need to hear the background. 
Thank you. Um, so you can see the vessel there working with remote control. The other video is here. There she is. Nice calm seas, wasn't it? It's pretty cool though. This vessel is being remotely controlled. And we got another short video here. They're bringing it alongside. <laughs> my, my friend's not in the video because she was taking it. But it gives you, these are the small ones. But they're out right now. And these were trials with the remote control center. Have you seen any of these maneuvering anywhere else? Have you seen them in any water? So these are, are in place now. The states are doing a lot of work on these as well. You can see videos of them. And the final one I haven't seen yet. We'll get it going. There we go. There she is happily steaming along. So these are from trials with a remote control center from yesterday. So this is what's happening right now while you're learning. It's important that you learn about autonomy and autonomous session um, vessels because by the time you are graduating, these will be much more mainstream. I'll close out my WhatsApp so you don't hear it beep at me. There we go. They have been used for surveys, actually. Yep. But they have been used for surveys where they've been controlled, um, not remotely, but right beside it. So they do use them, especially for surveys. Some of them can actually be autonomous and do surveys on their own following a line, and they've been used for surveys. The concepts of a completely, they're very small, these ones, you can see. You've got to a 78 meter vessel. I think that's what people are getting really worried. I didn't show you the uh, Vera Verica land, which I'm probably seeing is the very big one, a big news story out of Norway. That was the very first one that they did. And she is up and working now. Um, she is working in the mode two, where there's autonomous systems um, that are controlled remotely, but there's somebody on board right now. So the Vera Verica land was one of the first visions they had. There are a number of companies that are working on this uh, Norway has been very active in this environment. There are some stories of, you know, news releases of the autonomous vessel that delivered this, what was it, the, um, oysters? They went from UK to France, so they delivered a, they, they actually delivered a cargo. So the very first time autonomously a vessel delivered a cargo was a box of oysters. But it was about that size, so it was a small thing. Domestically, it's not such a big issue from a regulatory point of view because you can have domestic rules and the UK has developed those. DNB, if you're interested in autonomy and training in autonomy, look at DNB or check the Australian Maritime College websites because they're developing training programs on that as well. So there's a lot happening here. Now there's trials and testing going on. There's some use cases already. Be up to date because by the time you graduate, there's going to be more happening, and it's going to happen faster. Now, somebody said to me once that we'll never see autonomous vessels in my lifetime. Um, and I think he's going to have to die within the next five years for that to happen. <laughs> because, because I do believe we are seeing them now. They're out there now. Maybe not completely autonomous and maybe not at the level that people are thinking, but they are there now. Yes. Oh, so the question is, can they be used for rescue operations? Most definitely. In fact, there's a really cool, oh, I should have found it. It's a great video. If you go online, there is a smart life jacket, life ring. So on the, on the, um, on the wharf, you know, you've got those rings in case someone falls in, you throw it. You can throw these out. They, they're smart. They actually drive. You can remote control it. You drive to the person. They got hold of it, and they drive it back again. So, so that's a very low level. But yes, most definitely. Um, can be used for search and rescue. We could be seeing well, I, whatever your dream is. Again, we're in this dream-based innovation. And that's really part of our industry 4.0. Yes. Um, uh, just in case we lose control of the remote uh, it enters territorial sea, <laughs> then what happens? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, the boundaries. Wouldn't it be great to have all of our charts digitally identifying all the boundaries, you know exactly where they were? 
So who belongs? Who does it belong to if it goes into someone else's waters? Yeah, good question. Very good question. The regulatory scoping exercise has been looking at all of these questions without all answers. But ask these questions. These are the questions that need to be asked. And one that nobody said yet is what about colleagues? The commission regulations. The interesting thing that came out of the regulatory scoping exercise is that these autonomous vessels should comply with colleagues. So we should have to change our knowledge of colleagues in order for our autonomous vessels to operate. Now that gave a big challenge to OI and Google and Masterly and all the ones developing. How do we do flag signals? There's nobody on the ship to raise a flag. Um, how are you going to put on your shapes and somebody that to do it? So they've actually come up with a solution for that. I think it's happened, so I can't say anything. But yes, so following should be addressed. Pretty cool. We are coming into the last exercise, and we're right on time. So this is all, I did read out the one from Malaysia because this is very similar to that. I want to know what skills do you need as a maritime professional right now? What do you think you need from all of this that we've presented, all the information? Don't think about what you're doing. Think about what you think you need. I have a good discussion on that. And then I want you to think into the future. So who's your first year? Who's your first year? How long is your course? How many years do you graduate? Two years. Two years. Okay. So I said five years. So just think you're out of the industry. What kind of skills are you going to need in five to ten years? Yeah. <laughs> so have that discussion. And then I want your ideas on how we can prepare for the future. Now what I'd like for this one, because this is a really, really great set of questions, I would like if you could somebody on a spare piece of paper write it neatly and send it to me or put it into a, a little um into a note or something and email it to me i'd love to have this and maybe i can create something like that slide from the malaysian workshop from you guys so what do you think are the skills you need now what the skills you need in the future and how can we prepare this is the last activity that we have before the final mentee, of course, you get a mentee at the end. I would do that to you if I could help us. This is your final activity. I'm going to give you probably 10 minutes again, and then we'll take up. But please, while you're doing this, I'd love to get your ideas and collect them. So if you can write them down, email them to me, piece of paper, old school, new school, I don't care. I will put my email up on there if you want to email them. Okay, over to you guys.
Okay, we'll take two more minutes, two more minutes, so don't forget, skills now, skills in five, ten, five to ten years, and how can we prepare it? Thank you. 
Okay, that's five. I'm going to go back to the volunteer basis for this one. And I'd like to know who wants to go first. Okay. Okay, everybody. Kids, uh, out. Uh, better communication skills. Always think ahead from a interesting point of view. Potential to coordinate. Critical thinking. The skills on development and management of AI. Skills on development and management of AI. Needed in five to ten years, making a better and adapted to a technological condition. The next five years, everyone must adopt the basic skill and knowledge on programming and data technology. Programs for maritime professionals, programming and digital technology based in service. Sorry. Implementation of digital. Thank you. And did you send that to me by an email or are you going to give me a piece of paper with it all? You're going to email it? Excellent. You can even just take a, quick, take a picture of it as long as I can read it and just email it to me. Who else wants to go? Okay, wait to the back first and then to the middle. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so I think uh, the first two questions will be a little inclined towards uh, maybe technological advancements and maybe technology. So as, as the first question reads, what skills are needed uh, now? So uh, as you know that the future is advancing towards uh, more technological advancement. So I think uh, we need to have more knowledge about AI and the uh, uh, in AI and in the automation industry. Uh, and for the second question, as it says, what skills do you think will be needed in five to ten years? So again, I'd say knowledge about I think a computer language and coding and AI is uh, and it is going to play an essential role in the future. Uh, and as a third question, how can we prepare maritime professionals for the future? So I think. Uh, uh, like from a personal perspective, if I say that there is not, not much awareness about the maritime industry, like at the colleges as well. Like if I have friends, you know, they will like start texting what course I'm doing. Like I'm doing BBA in LRE, so they will ask what is LRE. So that knowledge should be more uh, more available to people. We should give them like uh, the availability of knowledge. I think, and again, I think there should be more courses coming up with AI and coding. I think. That's my name. Excellent, thank you. And again, please make sure you send that to me. My email is on the screen. Do what we think the skills require the idea of our communicating effectively, communicating uh, effectively with uh, the media and the Uh, communicating effectively uh, within uh, within the superiors and the subordinates so that there's no so that there's the communication gap will be filled between them. Uh, critical thinking and 
active listening uh, and time management is for other skills needed currently. Uh, future skills for you think is machine learning and AI as it was mentioned. Uh, it, it helps to create more accurate forecasting outputs uh, and also it provides sustainability and it reduces the operational cost of the industry. How can we prepare my maritime professionals for the future? We can, uh, we can provide them with you know, digital literacy as well as you know, knowledge and technolo technology wise they should be upfront they should, uh, uh, they, so that they, should, they adapt to it pretty well. So the training and development uh, sector should focus on it, focus on them and it will help the professionals grow in the future in the coming five ten years. <laughs> Oh, thank you. And you will say that to me, right? Yeah. Who wants to go next? Yes. And good afternoon, all. Uh, Please, we here now. Please, right? Problems are in the capacity. No. No one has done equipment. A patient about maritime industry. Skills that we hear is quite good and new. Technical skills to be obtained for the new updated technologies, communication should, should be improved. I love the fact that we're getting away technology, yes, definitely, but also critical thinking, communication skills. Excellent. Who wants to go next? Thank you. Don't get to send that stuff to me, right? Good morning, everyone. So, the skills required in the current scenario is knowledge about tools, equipment, technology, technology, and the ability to learn new things, culture, and art, and the coordination of activities and talking. In the next five to ten years, we can get more technology to support the carbon and AI based navigation, advanced knowledge about uh, automation. Knowledge about land based management and knowledge about commercial and organization. Preparing maritime persons for a coming for a coming change in the future can be looked at the creation of virtual and organization. Connecting good enough grants and workshops, studying awareness about mental health, and focusing more on soft skills rather than the past skills, seeing the gap in the future, the past skills becomes. Thank you. Have you sent that to me yet? You can always just take a picture. How does that mean? Next. Oh. Uh, for the first question, what is the now? Uh, now we are going to do the basic knowledge like actually between the top things, the management, competitive excellence, uh, the player, and the club. Uh, as you all know, from 5 to 10 years, uh, this will be a new era of uh, automation. So, uh, proper understanding of how AI works and skills uh, about uh, AI and all of that. And so, preparing uh, the maintenance uh, process for the future, uh, we should get more awareness process, uh, more process of knowing is. AI systems, that's my answer to you. Thank you. And you know what I'm going to ask, right? Yeah. Make sure you send it to me. I think you're going here. Are you speaking? No? No one here? Ideally, someone else. You should speak. Yes, go for it. You know what you want to say. Navigation, physical navigation, plans, rockets, toys, able, able to adapt to different climate conditions, controlling the automated navigation, controlling, planning,
skills we are in our actually we are learning terrestrial navigation is already outdated but uh, still we are teaching ourselves and we are all learning so even i have seen uh, videos of uh, seekers who are saying why these people are in the bus why uh, these cadets are learning this actually uh, even not uh, textbooks or an opportunity but we are learning that that is the technology so skills That we needed now are analytical skills, cognitive skills, decision making, communication, adaptation and flexibility, and soft skills. The skills that we target uh, in the upcoming five ten years should be communication, creativity, and proactiveness. On looking uh, for the pro, how can we prepare our paradigm for the future? We can look afterwards and the upgradation. Because it is something that makes them uh, for the upcoming events or anything like that. The second one is the better learning and teaching methodology, and the third one is that we can come with the initiative of weekend webinars so that it will enhance the learning of paradigm paradigm tools. It will help them to gain a better knowledge, and it will be a better platform so that they can attend the weekend webinars. Excellent. We may have time for one last one. Okay. Good uh, afternoon, friends. Uh, skills required in maritime industry. Actually, we have two sectors: uh, management sectors and sea coast sectors. In technical skills, in management sectors, are uh, uh, we want uh, the uh, warehouse management, blockchain technology for purchasing and uh, management, and in uh, for sea coast sectors, we want Awareness of safety measure on ship and uh, knowledge of big data and IoT within ship. Now, in uh, management sector, human skills we will require that uh, emotional intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence training, communication guidelines and training with respect to management and offshore sectors. And in C sector, we want a DEI and A critical thinking and risk management. Thank you. That is amazing. What you have identified are excellent. I'd like to make sure you get a copy because my thought is that we can put together a bit of an infographic, just like they did in Malaysia, on what you think are the skills needed now 
the skills needed in five to ten years and how we can prepare. That brings me to the final mentees. We do have one last mentee. So what are we waiting for? Um, it's going to be a really quick one. I had to shorten it down because we're running out of time. Put that on. It's actually up and running already. So you can do the QR code and then I'm going to drag it over. I'm just going to wait until someone's no longer pointing at the screen. They stop pointing at the screen. I will slide the mentee over. Okay, I'm going to slide the mentee over. Don't worry if you've missed it. You can actually still, there we go. You can still add into it. What are your three takeaways? Now, yes. <laughs> you can be serious too. <laughs> Although I do love it when the emojis come out. I love the emoticons. Okay, so what are your three takeaways from this session? What are three things that you have learned? Because the whole goal here is that you're learning something. So what are three things that you've learned? If you didn't get the QR code, just go to menti.com and enter the code 61581969. I love the fire, the flame in the middle, the flame of knowledge. Woo. <laughs> super, great. And again, if you put the same word in, that's great because it just makes that word look bigger. That's a joy of a word cloud. Okay, Rolex, does someone have a Rolex? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually pretty big, more than one person put it in. <laughs> okay, we've got new technologies, future technologies, automation. What else do we have up here? We're looking at some of them are fairly small, we're going to get them bigger. Hope, well, let's see. It moves so fast, it's really hard to read it. It's so cool. I love it. It's like it's like a living being. I can't I can't catch up. Wonderful session, thank you. Technology. Technology, technology. No types today. Where are we? I'm trying to read them. Yeah, love tech. That's a good one. I love it. Yes, you should love tech. Because it's cool. It's here. It's what we have. But also love those human factors. You are the human working with a machine. You're the human in the loop. Just like that OECD compass says, you need those knowledge, skills, and attitude, but you also need the values. A computer can have a knowledge and a skill. The values it gets programmed in are the values of the programmer. You have your values, and they change as you grow. And your levels of confidence change as you grow, and it is a cycle. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. We are now coming to the end of the session. We unfortunately, I don't have time. We have time for a couple of questions on open mic there. What do you think? We have a couple of questions on open mic. We'll try that. Five minutes. Okay, good. So I'm going to get five minutes for open mic. Ah, my flight came up. Thank you. I don't see a Canadian flag. up there. Are the recycle symbols up there? That's really cool. Okay, that's good. What I will do is <laughs> I'm going to slide this off. I'm going to leave it open. We'll pop out, pop it. We'll come back into it later. I'm not going to shut it down. I'm just going to slide it away. Oh, so cool. Okay, I'm just going to slide it away this way. Okay. And then I do want to move into the open mic. Where's my mouse gone? There it is. There's a great quote. This is going to the open mic that is out there that I've used many times. So Pia Heim is a Danish philosopher. And he ends this quote, he says, when technology is master, we reach disaster faster. Well, I think we just want to change that a little bit. 
And I said, to avoid the disaster of technology being masters, humans and machines must collaborate faster. <laughs> Which means it's open mic. Any questions? Ask me anything about being human in the maritime industry, about technology in the maritime industry, about anything that we've covered over the past five days. Yes. First of all, thank you, Vivian, for giving us, to making us think that automation is not to take away our jobs, it's to improvise and enhance what we are going to do on foot. So, I have two, I have two very simple and outdated questions. So, we, we spoke about skills and training and also, I want clarification on the impact of this technology and innovation. Uh, which are going to affect through, like, through our health and security, health and safety, sorry. And also, the second question is, uh, this improving technology <laughs> and also this innovation, uh, why are they not made in case of occupational health and safety of seafarers on board? I saw very few loss in regulations. So I mentioned updated, might be there, I want to know what are they. Very good question. Um, not really updated, so it's like two parts, both linked to occupational health and safety, safety and welfare of seafarers. So there are laws and regulations governing your safety and welfare of seafarers, and it's in the Maritime Labor Convention. So learn the Maritime Labor Convention, learn what is in there, because those are the rules by which your companies should be playing the game. They are required. The flag states have a responsibility, and there are responsibilities all the way down the line, but you as a seafarer have a responsibility to know what your rights are. They, they are there. Now, we did look earlier in the week, some people were here for that, so apologies, we looked at fatigue and sleep. The hours of work are still pretty incredible and one of the things that we need to work on are addressing hours of work and a day of rest. Because when you're working on a ship, three months solid, one year solid, however long, there's no day of rest. You're working every day, seven days a week, and it's exhausting. So that is something the IMO have opened up and tripatrite sessions so the IMO and the ILO and the Seafair Welfare Board organizations are working together to see what they can do to uh, enhance the existing requirements during the Maritime Labor Convention. And a lot of this has come to light, especially through COVID, but it was always there. Uh, at least COVID shed more of a light on it. Technology to support. Now, the other part was a really exciting one. Technology to support Seafair Welfare is happening right now, and it is wonderful. I participated in an online session with a ship off the off of South Africa, working on seafarer welfare, providing them with skills for conflict management to re the resolution of conflict. Um, because when you're living, it's like a family. You know, you don't always get along with your brother or sister. You don't always get along with your fellow seafarers or your your other seafarers. This is an interesting thing in DEI. I promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Do you know the times, the number of times I said guys or your fellow seafarers? It is so ingrained in our language, language matters. So please, I'm trying to catch myself on it, catch yourself on it as well. So every seafarer that's out there, you may not always get involved. And the opportunity to have training programs being new to you via internet is amazing. You also have access to organizations like ISWAM, um, organizations within the IMO. They have a, a if there's a, something that's significant, such as what's happening with the heroic heathen, we see that the IMO is stepping in. But there's Mission to Seafarers, there's Stella Mars, there is ISWAM, there are ICS is doing a lot of work. So there's lots of organizations. Knowing those alphabet soups that we went through is important because they're all out there to help you. And technology means that we access them better. Um, so that's one thing. So. Yes, oh, it's going to follow up. And we had people using like uh, 
shipping company is using for internet on board which cause CPRS uh, to lead to mental isolation and also severe stressors on board which, which, which lead to many problems. Do you think user for technology could lead to something else? Uh, having technology on board a vessel, having internet on a vessel is a double-edged sword. We know that. Um, when you when you know what's happening at home, it can make you more homesick. But being connected, I think, is critical, and we expect connectivity. In fact, the the documents that I've read in the past has identified that internet connectivity is becoming a human right. So we need to have that access. It is a double-edged sword, and yes, there could be some concerns by getting internet on board, high-speed broadband internet, but my goal is that every seafarer gets it, so you actually have a level playing field. You don't have to go sit outside the chief officer's tower to try and grab hold of his Wi-Fi, or you don't have a ship going close to the shore to try and get the connectivity and then running aground. The so, yeah, high-speed broadband, I think, is something that is... It's coming, it's possible. You can get high speed broadband anywhere in the world with Starlink. So, why don't we have our ships at a reasonable cost, too? You know, not, not $10 a megabyte or something. Does that answer? Not really? No, what is the other one? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so, so. Isolation, mental isolation. I think that the internet, having the capability for the internet, should ideally alleviate that isolation feeling. You agree? Yes. You agree? Okay. So that's good. Using more technology could mean that we don't have as much physical tasks to do, but more mental tasks to do. So we need to keep ourselves mentally at the. I'm not really sure how more technology is going to affect. Uh, it's already happened with less group, so we have less group, which then adds to the isolation. You need to have that connection with your crew, and you need to have the connection off the ship as well. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see as we go. We will actually ultimately have uncrewed vessels working with crewed vessels in the same waterway. So that would be intriguing. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to come. We don't have all the answers. But I do hope that. You, as every young seafarer going out there, and those ashore making connections with those seafarers going out, keep in contact and know that you need to have that connection. That is part, that relatedness aspect is something that we need. Is that it? Time's up? Oh, one, one sec. Okay. Thank you, Snooze. 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 Um. I just want to bring it. Uh, when was it the uh, then that we went to Pondicherry? First week of October? Yeah, so first week of October, a uh, lot of faculty from various campuses of IMU were sent for a two day training in Pondicherry. And the very first thing they did was in the morning when you start the class, there's a box and they take all our mobile phones in your way. So many of us think that we can't live without mobile phones for two days, we did not have the phones with us. And, and that's an area where there is, we don't even get signal. So it's possible. So where did we get the motivation from? The same training institute, they told us that the Indian cricket team, all that Tendulkar and Danguli, they had come there. And they were asked to do the same and they did the same. So it's possible. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's possible. It's possible to be without your internet, without your mobile phones. I think though from the yeah, it's good. I like that. Could have had to go without mobile phones, but you have connectivity. And connectivity on a ship is important for connections. If you have fewer people on a ship, you need to find connections somewhere. Yeah. Right. I used to get a letter every six weeks. A funny story, I sent a letter home to my mother. I wrote her a letter. Six weeks later I got a letter back from my mother. It was my letter, proof read. <laughs> I thought that might be the people. Any, I think that's it. One more question or not? Yeah. One more question. One, uh, 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 mm, 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 mm. okay, two last questions. How long is yours going to be for answering? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> okay. Uh, now, uh, the thing is, uh, over the past decade, we have seen that rather than IQ being a factor, EQ has become something that has developed over the years. And now, uh, do you think in the next 10 years, we can have emotionally intelligent integrated systems in ship which can make the lives of the people onshore and offshore better? I mean, the thing is, I am like right now, me being a student who is studying management, sector of the maritime, I see that there is a major gap between the people who are working on the ship and people who are working on the ship. But the thing is, do you think, we, like, rather than having basic training programs, we can have an emotionally intelligent AI system which can help us, you know, bridge that gap? That's a really cool idea. Um, emotional intelligence is so important. Digital emotional intelligence is really important. Um, so it would be great to see more connection and more emotional intelligence in idea. I like the idea. <laughs> Very good. Very cool. Uh, my question is apart from that what we have teached, uh, you, you have teached. My question is simple that as, uh, as we are targeting to focus more on development, for example, the countries which are underdeveloped, they are focusing to be the in a developing countries. The countries which are in developing, they are focusing to be in a developed countries. So my question is that being a, uh, targeting to be you know, more in a development, are not we harming our environment? Are not we are not we uh, can't we have development as well as an ecosystem coexist in the same way in the same uh, so that these uh, effects such as global warming will not affect our future generation. Can both these things coexist in the same way? So back again, developing. Can can we have a development without affecting our environment? Wouldn't that be great? Yes, I think we need to have developments that don't affect our environment. Yes, most definitely. But that means we need to look at those unintended consequences when we do a development. So when we are looking at using hydrogen fuels to help with greenhouse gases, we need to know. Are we able to make those fuels? So I do believe that we could have development without affecting the environment. Um, I do. We're going to develop countries and developing countries as well, and I believe that we need to bridge that gap. And I actually think the developing countries, the developing countries have a lot to give because we're the ones who have the vision and have the. You're living in it right now. Uh, friends of mine in Majuro and Marshall Islands. Are, are looking to see are they going to have a place to live. They're living in it right now. I have a friend of mine from Newway, she's at COP27 right now because the islands, the small island nations are sinking because of global warming. So we need to have the innovative solutions so that we do have developments that do not affect the environment. And from now on, any environment, any, I would say personally, from now on, if there's an invention that comes out or development comes out, it should have a filter on it. And the very top one is, will it affect the environment? And if the answer is yes, you throw that idea out because we can't afford it anymore. And that's it. We're done. Woo! Woo! Turn this off now, right? No, no. Okay. Okay. As rightly said by Jonathan Lockwood, celebrate endings for their pristine new beginning. They've also reached to the end of this five day program, Yang 2022, uh -huh. presented by International University Kochi Campus. As an American author named Ryan Frank once said, No thief, however skillful, can rob one's knowledge. And maybe that's why knowledge is the best and the safest treasure to acquire. And I truly believe that the knowledge and the experience gained from this giant program is immensely precious. Isn't it? Yeah. Right. Now I call for our director, Dr. Mohammed Shahi, to please share his views on the scene. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, then, in the opening talk, 
and our comrades the idea or the purpose of this gad after attending this you might have got it yes or no yes sir gilian might have energized your cognitive skill i know for the last few days one week we had discussed about a technology improvement human element new developments but only thing is to i i open up you might talk that is i used to energize your cognitive skill okay by interacting with you giving ideas with you that is what the gyan program is supposed to be and we are happy from your smiling faces we have achieved <laughs> 50% i cannot say anything cannot be wrong okay of that one and uh, future in the coming days you have to carry it in your class yesterday she has taken a class to us which is faculty different types of learning process teaching process incidental learning intentional learning accidental learning okay normally in our days what is this is it and different techniques definitely we, we accept that one we understood that one we will definitely going to implement in your future classes also and you will also reflect and react to those new improvements new techniques new methods that is what is the take away of this program and when i come to the last few minutes understand okay we are discussing on the technology actually i am again i would like to call again the words of jilly jackson Gillian Jackson technology should not be the crux of that one. technology should not be your master you should master the technology implement it okay you learn it but when somebody is discussing about internet on board okay i am recollecting my earlier memories when there was no communication on board suppose i want to it's an experience one of my friend with me he want to make a call to his home maybe before the era of this mobile communication he has to go to the bridge then he has to ask that there is a person called a radio officer his duty time is a limited he should be there at that time the radio room ask him i want to make a call to my home he will not doubt and then he has to contact the local station maybe available may not be available then they will ask what is your call sign what is your mmsi number okay you stand by i will let you know whether call can be connected or not maybe it may take hours to hours to get it connected then you go to your cabin he may contact you okay come back you can make a call then second thing is you will ask what is your accounting authority who is accounting authority give the name of accounting authority give them then again they will check it suppose this call is gone they will get the payment it may take maybe hours or minutes can be gone hours also at the end they will communicate to you am i right madam is it okay you can make a call give the number then you communicate the number this number from the local radio station to your home where it may be communicated ask them there is a call from from the ship then they will pick up the phone but the most important part is it is just like a walkie talkie talk if you are not conversant to deal with the talk nothing can be communicated when you press it they will say you cannot hear it when you release it you cannot hear it so you should be you should be skill in that one that is not be possible every day but now that was the time when we say communication you somebody was saying that communication on board now what is the problem because you say that this is asher you mentioned that is the bottom it is a, what is called is it but now you remember those days i am remembering those days how people that means nobody used to communicate when the ship reaches the port then only you can have a communication then also in the berth long queue with the std booths normally duty person will send the person right by number also there because when his duty come back the duty his train will come with another he will be again the queue but let us stay very few years back for some experience i have gone and bought and seen that everybody is having their mobile phone you don't have to worry anything when you want to talk you just okay dial the number you will get wherever you are okay that is the beauty actually i would like to say that communication has given 
much facility to the seafarer, much, much facility to seafarer. That is one of the... Okay. So, what the other thing is, you have to use what is said is right. Even I witnessed that one. People on duty doing this one. It is not allowed. And they may be confined to their room only using this internet or WhatsApp chat. But you have to be, because in vessel or ship is concerned, normal, what happened, what, what is we get, is very few people are there. Social interaction is much, much to be enhanced there, improved there. Then only you can have a good life. You may be knowing the recent ship, is it? Which, what is the name of the ship? MD Heroic? I don't. When did it come to the limelight? How long? Tell me. Limelight. When you come to know this name? Maybe one week back. Is it? But when it when this problem has happened? Almost three months back. Eighty days now. Yeah, it is in August, somewhere in the August eighth or tenth. Okay. That means all those three months. Those are seafarers were. Is it? They are they may be suffering or but they get, they have trained to that level. Okay. That means when the community outside come to know only, we know their distress. Okay. So I mean, that is okay, different type of so, means communication. We cannot say that communication is uh, bad for that, but it should use for the what but its purpose. That is I told you, I conveyed to you that you should be should not be the master. You should be the master of anyway. I uh, you don't want to take too much time. <laughs> I uh, wish to convey all my all on behalf of Indian Maritime University, all campuses, because we are conducting the GAN program for the, all campuses. And so I convey my the gratitude of the university to, to Julia. And uh, what are the takeaway? She, you, uh, you gained should be practiced in your future classes and it should be conveyed to other students who are not attended. Some of you have attended the whole session, all the five day session. Some of you have partly attended it, but convey to that. Let it be a fruitful. Okay. Let yes. it be. Thank you. I am not uh, continuing this one. Okay. I express again my thanks to all. And Captain Nambi also was already arranged for the five days for the entire program. Thank you. Thank you for all the students also. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I call upon Mr. Abhinav Kiran for sharing his valuable experience which he gave to Gyan 2022. Thank you, Mr. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I am here to say feedback about this uh, session as a uh, student. So I was a uh, student coordinator of this event and uh, I am participating in this event for the past five days. So, first, I would like to share my experience as a participant in this event. Uh, <laughs> before uh, this GAN event, I had uh, self doubts about my capabilities. If uh, I am being honest, uh, uh, we had uh, then a session about SBA and work. If anyone uh, remembers, so on that uh, on that session, uh, I had uh, shared the same doubt. So uh, I was uh, trying to uh, get good marks and uh, good results, but I was not uh, getting the results I was expecting. Even after I am uh, doing the work. So what should I do? I was uh, very uh, tense and uh, eager to know what should I do. So will, when I become a sailor, uh, will I uh, will I be bad, or will I become a danger to the crew and the ship? So I am uh, trying to improve. Uh, uh, I was trying to improve, and uh, through all this uh, session, I gained uh, some confidence because I was uh, actively listening here, asking questions, explaining some topics. Even uh, I had a uh, note uh, before this uh, yeah. So I was explaining uh, to my colleagues uh, these topics. So that that was a wonderful experience. And uh, I should uh, say thanks to Jillian Karzelna uh, because uh, she uh, gave us, uh, she would say to put uh, forward some concerns and she would uh, say to find solutions for that. 
she would uh, never say the solutions we would uh, we should uh, we would have to find the solutions so by uh, finding these solutions i had find solutions for my problems and uh, my experience as a uh, coordinator if i am uh, saying my experience as a coordinator uh, this uh, planning of this event started uh, weeks uh, weeks before so uh, and an event like this cannot happen overnight it uh, needs planning and birds uh, thanks to abhinav uh, navin sir and thank you uh, thank you uh, being a part of this event uh, and uh, i would like to thank other student coordinators uh, uh, shivani jyoti arjuna shok arjuna raya gaudam and uh, my dear second year juniors anandu ashwin chandra and uh, a special mention for second year uh, they have arranged this chair and everything um, and i would i like to share uh, one more thing uh, what's my uh, take away from this uh, session so before that i would like to mention about a book i had read its uh, name, name is who moved my cheese in that book uh, it's uh, that book uh, book revolves around four characters that four characters represent four uh, human emotions uh, two of the ca characters uh, is representing uh, humans who are uh, futuristic and uh, adaptive to changes and uh, one uh, one of the uh, character in that book uh, represent a person who can uh, see the change in the future but he is ready to adapt to changes when uh, situation uh, circumstances uh, demands and the last character in that book uh, did not want to change he want to sit in his comfort zone and uh, he can change up to uh, up to the circumstances so uh, before uh, coming uh, to this session i always had uh, doubt about automation most of uh, us had the doubt will be lose our jobs as we are, we are navigators what is our future so now i believe uh, we are not going to lose our jobs but we are going to control ai and these technologies uh, so uh, in the book uh, in a uh, homo uh, in the book a uh, homo uh, my cheese uh, says i am not going to uh, wait for my cheese to uh, until my cheese is getting empty i am going to run and find cheese for uh, myself so that the enlightenment i got from this session so i wish everyone all that enlightenment from this session thank you well said the viewers so it's truly an honor to be a part of this wonderful event now i call upon captain navin to say a few words so please <laughs> so um, let me just reflect on the last five or six. Because we met on Monday. Yeah. Okay. So let me just put the difference between we and Jigen. Okay. So I figured out the first difference is you're from the southern hemisphere, <laughs> you're from the northern hemisphere. Yeah. Um, Jillian says come back after break in two minutes, and we always come back after twenty minutes. <laughs> um, Jillian is always conscious about the lesson. We are always conscious about the break. Maybe the difference between southern and northern hemisphere. What's Jillian's menu? She always keeps talking to me about: Is the projector okay? Is the connection? Where's the HDMI? Where's the LAN internet connection? And we always talk about what's for lunch. 
There's a fish coming off. Yeah, so there's a lot of difference between Southern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. That's on a lighter note. But on a serious note, I just want to go back and, uh, you know, always you have this concern and influence. What really is education? I would say probably if you go many years back, education was about always knowing the history. Somebody kept making history and we kept learning about it. It was all about history, past. And then came education is about knowing the present so that we know about it, so that we can do something. Right? We need to do something, we need to know about it. It was about learning, learning how to do. But now it's not about the past, it's not about the present, it's about education, it's about learning about the future. Right? And that's what the whole five days was about. We are always talking about things which, which are going to come. So, so you can see education has changed, transformed from what was to what we be. So I think uh, you know, that's a transformation that we all have gone through. And you are all here to learning about what is going to happen. Maybe it's not yet there in the world. That's change in education. So I just wanted to bring out so we need to adapt to it, we need to be there, we need to up our skills, we need to stay updated and upgrade. There is no two choice about it. Okay. Um, I also want to mention about this process of Gyan. So it started from, as I mentioned, it started from the Ministry of Human Resource and Development, the initiative, then it came, came to ILU. Uh, then it came to who would be the speaker. We had to identify a speaker. Then it came to identifying or finalizing the lesson plan. What would the speaker talk about? Then it came to campus. Which campus would do this YAN scheme? And then it came to organizing this program in the campus. So we passed through all this. It's always a process. So we have passed through all the process. But finally, this was all done for you. So, if the process started from right higher up, now it has come to you. Do you want to stop it with that? Yeah, you have to carry forward. You have to carry forward. So, it shouldn't stop with that. Then we are not going to get the returns of what we gained in five days. It should carry it forward. And for that, let me just tell you, if I am a student and if somebody asks me, why did you come to the university? In fact, this was the, the question that was asked to me in my interview when I was uh, getting into the Indian Maritime University. They said, oh, you, you got, you're working in a private firm, you are paid much more, you're not going to get that pay over here. So what is it that you are coming here, changing from that job to a government job? So I said university. That's all. I want to be in a university. I don't want to be in a college. I want to be in a university. So why do you want to be in a university? I don't come here to learn. Right? What are we learning? We are learning the change. A lot of things are changing in the world. We have come here to learn the change. I have not come here to learn about the change. I have come here to make the change. Yes. So the university is the right place to make the change, right? So I think that is what, you now we have trained about uh, 400 to 450 students, maybe duplicated, but uh, 400 to 450 students who came here in the last five days. But I'm sure in that there must be at least four of you who can make the change. And you should work towards that. And she showed the video, some of you must have watched it the influence of the first follower. So once you forget in, there will be 40 who will come in. And there will be 450 will come in. And those who don't join, initially uh, they were ridiculing the people who are dancing. Then last, it was the people who don't join will be ridiculed. So everybody is there in the group. So that's what we should take it for. Okay? 
And as Kandala mentioned, it doesn't happen overnight. So, thanks to uh, campus director, Shaji sir, because as I mentioned, we came to which college would do it. We had no doubt that it would be done first time again in university, we would be the one to do it. Thanks to him. <laughs> thanks to, very thanks to uh, Gillian. Uh, I think um, I should mention that um, you have a lot of exchange of communication and thanks to all the new communication methods, we are all the exchange of communication to decide upon what she will teach you. So we started from somewhere, and there would be some email exchanges, WhatsApp exchanges, uh, some Zoom meetings that we had and finally we said, okay, we will come down to these five topics. So we took a lot of your time, not just on this five days. So thank you and she's a very, very busy lady. So thank you so much. Uh, Acknowledging and coming here, and, and uh, of course, thanks to the organizing team. You know, uh, everything looks so set when you come in, you just come, set, attend, and go. But there's a lot of work that goes behind it. So, uh, shall I? Jillian would like to give them a small token of uh, gift for them, for the organizing team, only for the organizing team. Yeah, I should you got it first, you come first. Yes, you are very much part of it. He became an expert photographer in the five years. So we will start with you. Somebody can take a photograph on your mobile phone. Is that okay? Mobile phone. Come quickly. So Ashwin can come and collect your small memento from Gillian. It's very small, but it's a little thing from Australia to remember you guys. Anandu, can you come next? But the wire is bigger, bigger than this. Oh, thank you. Anandu, he's been working really hard to make sure that Jillian, we had all the supplies of tea, water, and I've all that. I've looked after. Yeah. Abhinav, <laughs> somebody can come. I can see Chandragant is not here, so maybe Sheikh, you can take it on behalf of Chandragant. You will be in the news with the picture, <laughs> but it's for him. But it's for him. Ashwin Nayan. Ashwin has smiled. Yeah, you got it. Okay, sorry. I thought another Ashwin. I'll keep uh, Shivani waiting. I can't see her. She's here. She's uh, behind the. Okay, Shivani, you can come in. So Shivani will stay back and she will collect. For the others? Yeah. Are there any, are there any others who are here? They are not here. So Arjun and Gautam. and Gautam. Just two more? No, I will take. Oh, okay. I will empty it for you. You will empty it for yeah. me? Okay. <laughs> so she had to, had to give her two more. Two, two more. Two more. Okay. Yeah. For Gautam and for Arjun. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And Yellow and green. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, we had three of them supporting with the IT, without which this wouldn't have happened. So maybe Ashwin, you can come in uh, for Rundas, Ratish and Robin. So three for, three for the IT team. One, two, three. So have we covered everybody? No, I just want to check with her. Cover everybody? Oh, she's up. I'm too late. So my last word. Thank you, Gillian, for that wonderful gesture of appreciating our organizers. I'm sure that they will be motivated to do much more. Uh, one more person. One more? Uh, Arjun Ashoka. Okay. Oh. You have one last? Yeah. Blue. Yeah. Blue. Okay. okay. Thank you. So one big, big round of applause for all the organizers.
So one last word for me. Uh, I think I shared with this uh, Vice Chancellor Madam when he met her yesterday morning that IMU Kochi campus, as you know, is the newest of all the six campuses that we have. So we are always at the back. For whatever reasons, we are always at the back. But I think uh, over the last five days, because of uh, Jillian, I believe that IMU Kochi campus is the most updated and upgraded campus now. Do you agree? <laughs> so Jillian, uh, I started with the difference between you and us, but I think after five days, uh, we are not having the difference, but I think you are now going to be part of our IMU family. So welcome yeah, to the IMU family. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now, request our director to please felicitate our lovely guests for a wonderful contribution for the Yale Fellows in Zoom. What we learned from the last few days is also teamwork. Okay, so then I request all the team leaders <coughs> come Organizing and we will team. together sit yeah. Okay, please come. <coughs> come on, let right here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, I'll get it. Keep it with you. After you look at it. Okay. Oh, so gorgeous. Look at the work on this. So, uh, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Anand. Yeah. Traditional. It's perfect. It's absolutely gorgeous. Keep it with you. One of these type of is the sovereignty is going to give the world like a football player. Oh, really? Not the same one? Not the different one, but different one. Oh, wow. Oh, it's so beautiful. My sailboat. Well, first, I'd like to say a few words about my experience. Okay. Okay, I think it's actually heard enough from me, probably, over the last five days. I guess my words that I want to say to you is thank you. Thank you for teaching me and for providing me with a vision of what the future can be, the future that you will be making. You are amazing. Each one of you are amazing, and you have provided me with so many wonderful memories, and I will take these with me always. You are now part of me and in my heart, so thank you so much, everyone. At the beginning, in the opening ceremony, which was overwhelming, thank you so much for organizing that, I said that teaching is lighting the dark places. And it really is my opportunity to have this chance to work with you, to help you see the light, to see the future in a different way. A future where you are making the change, where you are the master of the technology of the change. So please just continue to move forward in that way and respect each other, each other's ideas, and have your eye on that future to make that future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mom.
So I think it's the end, right? So on behalf of the organization, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guest, Mr. Jimmy Curtis Jackson. Thank you so much, ma'am, for being here and cherishing this event with us. It really means a lot. I would also like to thank our director, Dr. Mohammad Shahi, for giving us this opportunity to come here to see. Also, since your time to be in the department of SNS and SMS, you handled the event throughout. Also, special thanks to the organizing committee, teaching and non teaching staff for their unflinching support and coordination. Finally, I would like to thank all of you present here for making your time with us and helping us to make this event such a grand success. Thank you all for being here. This is Nishwani Jodi signing off. See you next time. Thank you all. Bye bye. Can we bring it up there? Oh, uh, let's do this. Do it up there? Oh, I see. You want that one up there? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, I just moved it up there. Oh, okay. I don't know what you're doing. What do you want me to do? Just to get what you need. Thanks so much, Mom. It's up there now. It's up there. So I just wanted. Do we bring it back again? Picture of cowgirl, Jillian the cow. I'll bring it back then. There you go. You decide what you want to do. You do it. Thank you. So, uh, when she am moving, I will, uh, and yeah, it's okay. I'm the other one. I'm the other one. So, that's what it is. I <laughs> 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 Hopefully we can figure it out. I <laughs> 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 I am not